Good morning, friends. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. It's honestly my total delight to welcome you all here today. I'm so excited about this symposium today, tomorrow. I mean, I was excited before when I saw everything on paper, but seeing you all, seeing all of you here and just the range and quality of scholarship in this room, it's really, it's awesome and awe-inspiring. I, of course, especially want to thank on the Watson side, John Eason, and everybody on the Urban Institute side for the really fantastic partnership that's delivered us to, to today. I, I won't speak for long, but I just want to say a, a word about why I feel this Justice Beyond Mass Incarceration Symposium is so central to what we're doing at Watson and what we're aspiring to do more of. The Watson Institute is, is poised to become Brown's uh, first school for international and public affairs. That will uh, likely happen officially about a year from now. But I mention that because the kinds of issues that you're talking about today, that you're educating us about today, this incredibly complicated and important intersection of issues surrounding the political economy of prison building, the political economy of the end of the prison industry, the political economy and the deep social justice issues surrounding the way citizens and communities, particularly marginalized communities, are on the receiving end of punishment. Those kinds of issues are central to our mission at Watson. And the way that you all go about studying these issues, deep empirical work, incredibly important conceptual framing, all linked to very real world issues and very contemporary issues that impact people deeply, not just in the United States, but comparatively across many places. This is what we do and what we aspire to doing more of. There, there are two aspects of the symposium that I really want to emphasize, again, in kind of a, an aspirational sense for what we're doing here at Brown. The first has to do with the linking and the deep linkage, the inextricable link between uh, fundamental, empirical, path-breaking empirical research, involvement of not just faculty but students in that research, and then the delivery of that research in the classroom in a curricular sense. In addition, the delivery of those research findings beyond just the curriculum to the communities and individuals that are affected by the phenomenon that you're all working on. To me, that's, that's, that's central to our mission. Um, I hope John doesn't mind if I call him out, but John Eason is running the Justice Policy Lab here at the Watson Institute, which does exactly what um, I just referred to. And I say that not in the sense of um, bragging at all. I say in the sense of John within the Watson Institute is really educating us all and leading us in this mode of education that I think is so important moving forward into the future. The, the second aspect that I want to emphasize, though, is we fully recognize that we at Watson, we at Brown can't do this alone. We fully recognize that in many aspects of this, we're not the leaders, that many of you at other institutions are the leaders, and we believe partnerships are essential to not just the academic enterprise here. Of course, partnerships are essential to the academic enterprise here, but they're essential, I think, to the goal that um, we all are trying to achieve, which is to say a achieving a more just and peaceful world for everybody, including and especially for marginalized communities. So the Urban Institute, of course, is partnering with us today and vice versa. I very much hope that partnership will continue into the future. I know it will. And moreover, I hope the range of partnerships that um, we're involved in in this study, uh, in this area of study, will broaden and deepen as time goes on. So again, let me welcome you. I'll be in and out over the next two days learning from you all, but thank you. And with that, let me turn it over to John Eason. John. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Ed, for that introduction uh, and to get us started. Uh, I know that this, this has been a long time coming. Uh, it, even the thunderstorms that many of you experienced, all of the turbulence, I've been hearing about stories this morning of <laughs> jump uh, pilots or uh, attendants needing to get in the jump seats uh, to, to prepare for landing, the rough roads all of you took to get here. Um, but this, this has been in the making long before this day. Uh, and I wanted to give you all a little bit of the genealogy of how this came about, and more importantly, why and where we're going. So 
This came about after uh, some discussions with other colleagues who were, we were around uh, newly tenured uh, colleagues. We were discussing our own uh, path and how we found the hidden curriculum of uh, being a social scientist. And it was in part through small, smaller symposiums because big conferences, and we all come from different disciplines, which I think is a real strength in this room right now. Big conferences, you can get lost there if you don't have a tribe, if you don't have people who are thinking like you um, and who are uh, not only asking questions like you, but uh, also figuring out and struggling through more difficult cutting edge work. And I think everyone in this room and even the folks who are not in this room, because we invited a lot of people. Um, last time I checked, there were over 500 people uh, registered for this event online. There are people who we wanted in person as well. We're hoping this isn't the first uh, first and only, we're hoping this is the first of many events like this, but these smaller events, and this began for some of us as far back as 2006 with the probing the Penal State Conference at Berkeley. Uh, there were a number of heavy hitter, big name scholars there who had brought in uh, graduate students like me and undergraduates like Ashley Rubin. We just figured out that's where we first met each other, right? Um, so after that, since then, we, I've been involved with other smaller symposiums like uh, the Pino, uh, Pino Boundaries Conference at UT, uh, at Toronto, University of Toronto. And these, these opportunities uh, allow you not only to present your work, but the, more important, uh, the more, more important parts of these smaller symposiums are the informal dinners and water cooler and coffee conversations and the ability to meet people you never would have met before. Uh, uh, Mona Lynch, who I hope is watching, uh, I met her at one of these conferences. She's on my book jacket, right? So that, those, are, those are sort of the informal things that, that you can get at these events. Um, and because I was given so much through those symposiums and through uh, the Racial Democracy, Crime and Justice Network, where we also have done some work like this, I, I thought I would give back, I would pay this forward. Um, and I think that uh, there's also a need to have alternative voices, um, especially if we're not gonna do standard uh, social science work. There's a lot of people in here doing great theoretical and empirical work, but in many ways, because we're on a cutting edge, many of us are on a cutting edge, we're studying things that may, see, may be seen as me-search or as normative, right? because we, we use the gift of proximity, uh, as Ruben Miller talks about. Many of us use our own personal stories and backgrounds to inform our research questions, and we don't all use big data sets, right? We often are interviewing people and doing careful ethnographic work. Um, and I think that's how you push the boundaries theoretically. So I am so, uh, so honored uh, for all of you to have shown up despite the weather. New England, uh, I'm not used to this weather yet. This is a different kind of bad than the Chicago or Wisconsin weather. This is awful. I don't know why it's raining at 40 degrees. This doesn't make sense. Just snow. Make, make up your mind. Just snow or not, not have precipitation. But I'm so happy all of you are here. Uh, like I said, I'm hoping that this inspires more conversations. I've had uh, our first panel is going to include uh, uh, Heather Schoenfeld is the discussant, but a number of undergraduate researchers. Uh, I do want to say um, one of one of the uh, one of the uh, undergraduate researchers I've been working with the longest. Uh, her plane did not make it; uh, it got canceled. Uh, we hope she will make it here. Victoria is uh, an example of the kind of work I hope to inspire in others. I met her when she was 17 or 18. Uh, she's been working in my lab since then. She started cleaning data. Uh, now she is she's uh, moving up to be lead author on uh, papers of her own. She's already published with us, and she's also selecting between several uh, highly uh, selective graduate programs. So I'm really I'm I'm pointing I'm I'm uh, really pointing towards Victoria in her absence because I think. She, she demonstrates the best of what a group like this can offer and bring forth. Um, so I think uh, I don't want to go on any further. I want to have uh, the panelists come up.
and uh, I'll have Heather introduce each of them as they begin their um, speech, as they begin to speak. Uh, housekeeping notes, oh, before I forget, I want to thank everyone from Watson, all of the staff here at Watson that have made this event possible, and I want to uh, uh, also point out that Ivy Hunter is in the first, um, she's in the first row. There's a number of uh, urban staff that have helped out with this, but she is the queen of logistics. She is sitting there. She, we have to have this event on time because it is being, it is being broadcast, and uh, you will get a stern notice. <laughs> you will see if you are, you will get your notices of how she will be keeping a time. And I'm hoping I'm a couple of minutes early, just so in case some of you are not following Ivy. And she's going to come for you. I'm just letting you know, because she's going to make sure this event is on time. So without further ado, uh, the first panelist, if you all could come up, I'm going to have Heather introduce you all. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm already enjoying this day, and I look forward to fellowshipping with you and learning from you throughout the day. Thank you. So um, as John said, uh, Victoria is not here, but I'm going to introduce uh, the rest of the panelists. We have Isabel Anandan, Assistant Professor of Sociology at uh, University of Buffalo, uh, State University of New York. Sarah Agundere, uh, Undergraduate Research Scholar, Justice Policy Lab at the Watson Institute here at Brown University. Caitlin Sims, Assistant Professor of Microeconomics and Public Policy at the University of Denver. Sam Theo Harris, also undergraduate student and scholar at the Justice Policy Lab, Watson Institute, Brown University. Um, and I am Heather Schoenfeld, Associate Professor of Sociology at Boston University. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this panel and thank you, John, for bringing us all together. You're totally fine. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Heather, my name is Kate Sims. Um, I think I have the distinction of being one of the only economists in the room. Uh, so please forgive me in advance for that. Um, additionally, please forgive me for not being our lovely Victoria. Uh, we are going to make sure that we are able to cover the same material as uh, in general because it doesn't necessarily to make sense to start talking about the prison bust without having first set the stage for the prison boom. Um, so we will go ahead and, and kind of get started by thinking about this, looking at the dramatic rise in the number of prisons that we've seen over the last couple of decades, thinking about mass incarceration trends. This is probably familiar to a lot of folks in the room. But one of the things that brought most of us, many of us, I don't know, a good chunk of us together is the data um, with which we're able to really think about how to, how to quantify this and how to think about it critically. Oop. There we go. All right, so when we start talking about the prison boom, we need to first think about its roots, right? And how has this reshaped the landscape of incarceration over the last several decades? Uh, so since the year 1970-ish, in the last uh, couple decades of the 20th century, there was an unprecedented increase in prison construction, talking about um, a scale that I feel like many of us think about abstractly, um, but to put it concretely, growing from over 500 facilities in the 1960s to over 1,700 by where we are now. Uh, and this is going to be marking the beginning of what we think of as mass incarceration, this phenomenon where the U.S. incarcerates more individuals per capita than any country in the world. 
a lot of folks um, have this mis this idea that this surge in prison construction was driven by corporate interests specifically seeking profit, so kind of in the driver's seat. And we want to kind of push back against this and think about it a little bit more in context of what the role of the state is. Um, so we can think about Alabama as one specific case of this. Um, Alabama has recently decided to invest over a billion dollars in constructing supersized prisons. And this highlights the complexity of the ongoing nature of prison expansion, something that is in fact um, related very strongly to corporate private profits, um, but where the state is an active player. So when we start thinking about incarceration rates over time, uh, we have this lovely graph from one of the papers that the lab has produced, uh, comparing our logged change in prison population from 1980 to 2010 on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, the number of new prisons over the same time period. So we see that there was a dramatic increase uh, in incarceration rates from approximately 198 per 100,000 US adults uh, to 670 per 100,000. And this reflects the domestic trend of mass incarceration, but also places the US at the forefront globally, right? So peaking at about 743 persons per 100,000 incarcerated in 2018. We see that this is um, not a Southern phenomenon, but something where the South is in fact a key contributor to the trend, both in terms of prison construction and incarceration rates that outpace the national average. There has been a noticeable slowdown in new prisons post 2000, uh, but incarceration rates, COVID excluded, COVID being a very weird thing that I'm sure we'll have lots of thoughts about. Um, but despite that, we saw incarceration rates that remained very, very high and disproportionately high in the US. And this suggests that the US's approach to incarceration is indeed an outlier, right? And this justifies a deeper examination of these policies and practices that have driven this trend. So I apologize for the tables. The numbers get really tiny. I'll walk us through what we need to know. So here we're going to present state averages of all variables included for our analysis. Um, we're thinking about this in terms of uh, all states and southern states from 1980 to 2010. So if you notice up here at the top, we have all states and then south, all south, all south for different decades. So looking over this 30 year span of data, we are able to see a pronounced rise from 198 per 100,000 people adult in 19, uh, incarcerated in 1980 to 670 uh, by 2010 in all states. But in the South, we saw this surge peaking at 889 adults. So a very large uh, gap created in the South compared to the national average. Carceral capacity also has a notable increase in the South, which went from housing seven prisons to 38 by 2010. And there's a strong drive towards building infrastructure for imprisonment. One of the things that the lab is really interested in that uh, John really drives us into thinking about is causes and consequences, right? How can we think about what things have generated this boom and then what has the boom generated in turn? So when we're thinking about the uh, places that are experiencing this prison boom, we can compare income inequality, land and labor. And we observe that there has been this increase over time suggesting that perhaps uh, increasing or growing economic disparity is paralleling this trend of increased incarceration. The poverty rate has fluctuated, and in fact, in 2010, it slightly decreased, which could imply that there has been um, perhaps a more complicated relationship between economic welfare and incarceration rates. And so in, data, in summary, we see that this prison boom is going to be multifactorial, right? There's economic conditions and racial demographics and a push for more carceral spaces all playing a role. And these insights are going to um, kind of drive the work that the lab is continuing to do going forward. Uh, so we look state by state. This is going to compare two states in our data set, California and Oklahoma, showing state averages uh, in those different decades. One of the things that we often talk about is while we can perhaps uh, generalize and say the prison boom, there are actually different patterns. And this is something that we're going to talk about more explicitly once we get into the prison bust section of today's talk. Um, and so California and Oklahoma are two prime examples of kind of these different narratives of the prison boom's scale and impact. So California expanded its facilities from 3 to 40, and Oklahoma from 14 to 47. So both had aggressive growth in carceral infrastructure. And in the South, uh, we saw that this was not isolated to Oklahoma. There's not one single state that's driving the bus here. Um, we see this in Texas, Florida, Ohio, New York, Georgia, all adding things in. <laughs> 
And so there's this uneven landscape of prison construction. This is not a national phenomenon. This is a repeated state level phenomenon, a repeated local level phenomenon uh, that we think is worth, worth study. When we think about operational capacity at the state level, um, we want to think about what does it actually look like inside of these facilities, right? How are states thinking about operational capacity? Are they operating over capacity and with chronic overcrowding? Um, are they managing below it? Because we think that this connects really strongly to the different policies that are at play. So here again, we've got California and Oklahoma. Uh, and we notice that uh, the overcrowding balance, uh, so the operational capacity uh, excuse me, overcrowding over time kind of varies in different states uh, with a rapid increase in operational capacity in some states representing the overall prison boom, um, but especially in the South. But we also think of the operational capacity as more than just a measure of space or bed spaces, right? This is a barometer for the state's approach to criminal uh, legal system and criminal justice more broadly. And we want to think about this from the perspective of a prison capacity management, so showing that Certain states are overcrowded, but certain states are not, right? So if we are going to believe that racism and profit-making motives are driving imprisonment, where prisons are an afterthought, we absolutely might want to kind of flip that thing and think about how are prisons actually an intentional part of this puzzle. So next, we are going to link prisons and incarceration rates. So thinking about here are the places that have been built. How are they being filled? This is a state level fixed effects estimate of the effect of the cumulative number of prisons built since 1970 on state incarceration rates two years later. Uh, this is something that we spent a lot of time in our papers talking about is what is the appropriate lag? How long do we think things are taking to build? Um, so if you have thoughts, I would love to hear them as the resident statistics nerd on the team. So when we're looking here, we see that uh, incarceration rates are preceding construction with incarceration as a response. An additional prison is associated with an increase in the incarceration rate, emphasizing the impact of carceral capacity on trends. And the, we see this as being um, a complicated relationship between increasing crime rates and prison spaces. So our findings suggest that the construction of prisons often precede rises in incarceration rates, indicating a supply-driven model of carceral expansion. We see this especially in the South, uh, where aggressive prison building has paralleled high incarceration rates. So what do we do with all of this information? Uh, what is kind of, what do we take away from it? And then more importantly for the researchers in the room, where are we going next, right? What is the plan for future research with this? So we have to understand the demand for prisons in rural town, recognizing the role of economic incentives and the need for local development. This is not a story of needing bed spaces because of crime rates. This is a story of a complicated um, tapestry of public policy making, of which prison construction is one, one key piece. This is gonna pave the way for understanding our comprehensive policy recommendations that tackle the root causes of incarceration, from enhancing social services to promoting economic opportunities in vulnerable communities. Uh, because fundamentally, we believe that if you want to uh, redo the carceral system, you have to start by giving rural communities better options. So as we start to consider the responsible closure of prisons or responsible decarceration, um, alternatives to incarceration become, become vital for this. So this could be things like thinking about uh, programs for drug treatment and community service, uh, that are viable options for reducing the prison population sustainably, and the repurposing of closed prison facilities, which offers a unique opportunity to support local development initiatives without relying on incarceration as an economic engine. I believe we're just going to go next into it. Okay, we are now at my slides, so <laughs> I will be stepping back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Victoria, in absentia, for wonderful notes uh, from which I read. Okay, so we are here to talk about the prison bus now. We have set the stage for the prison boom, kind of this expansion, uh, but has this continued? We're gonna argue no. We is a pretty decently sized team uh, in the lab, including Isabel, Victoria, Louis, uh, Jacob, who are both not here, as well as Eason, Chloe, yes. I'm like rocking through the, walking through the byline in my head. There was a big group of us, a large Zoom call often. So we, uh, wanted to ask the question of, okay, the prison boom has been well documented. We've seen this in a lot of places. Has this been something that's continued? Um, and if not, what are the perhaps the theoretical reasons for this? So using data that we have collected, uh, we being largely the efforts of Victoria Lewis and Jacob, 
um, have the first comprehensive record of prison closures between 2000 and 2022. This is the universe of secure confinement state and federal prisons. So it's 188 closures. The economist in me is like, oh, it's not a large number. But it's a pretty large number. And we're able to run um, some really interesting regression analysis on this, um, especially compared to the number of facilities in general. These data were collected via public records requests, as well as prison census data and news reports, um, lots and lots of FOIAing. And it's going to represent the elimination of over 128,000 prison beds in the United States. So this is a 9% decrease in carceral capacity, or a 16% decrease in the total number of secure confinement prison facilities, which was one of our initial questions in motivating this is, 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 is this just reorganizing the state of incarceration, perhaps um, putting more folks into fewer facilities, but we actually see um, in general a decrease in beds. So we, in this paper, which was published in November, I believe, uh, in Punishment in Society, provide the first evidence of a prison bust beginning in the year 2000, peaking in the year 2008. So here I have a wonderful figure of prison openings in gray, prison closures in black. You may notice that the black line does not continue into the past. That's because our data start in 2000. Nothing funky there. So we see that the, this provides strong evidence. Do we have a laser? Oh, amazing. Uh, so this is going to provide strong evidence of what we talked about earlier, this prison boom, right? We see starting in 1960, things have been really flat. Starting in the 70s, they peak up, they peak up, they peak up, and then they really are just increasing with 60 new facilities in a year. But it starts to move down, right? So by the time we stop talking about our data, we generally are looking at around 2010, by which point the prison bust is starting. So the number of closures is relatively consistent until we hit 2008. You might remember there were some things that happened in 2008, 2009. It's a weird time for financial uh, precarity in the public sector. So that gives us a sense like at scale, if across the US, how many closures are we talking about? Here is going to be a map of openings of prisons across space and time. Uh, you might notice a couple of interesting trends there. Some things that I take away from this map um, are we have a lot in California, not a surprise to many of us in the room, um, but definitely representative of kind of what we've talked about with carceral capacity, as well as other big players. We've got Texas, we've got Florida. I'm not going to embarrass myself with my geography by pointing out other states, um, but a lot happening over here on this eastern seaboard. Um, still a good amount happening kind of in a little bit more open space in more of the Midwest front range region. Um, but we're seeing a capacity expansion that is the equivalent of over 860,000 additional prison beds over a 30 year period. Here I have the closures. So we'll just do a real quick little flip. You might notice that the closures are also clustered but in interesting ways, right? So we have some closures here in California and Washington state, a few out here in the middle and in Texas, but largely when we're thinking about closures, we're thinking about things that are happening on the Eastern seaboard, um, little in Michigan outside of like Illinois and um, a little in the Midwest, excuse me, outside of Michigan and Illinois. But this decrease is, is also substantial, right? We're also talking about 129,000 fewer beds um, over a 20 year period. So, one of the things that we do in our analysis is we're going to compare characteristics of closed facilities. Uh, so we're looking over here with our N of 188 facilities that close uh, between 2000 and 2022. And here we're going to look at different characteristics of these facilities. So what is happening in terms of custody level, the sex of incarcerated persons there, etc. We see that there's pretty decent variation actually in the level of custody. I mean, half of them are going to be in these minimum security facilities. Their uh, median capacity is about 500. Uh, most of the facilities that are closing are male facilities, which is probably a reflection of most facilities being male facilities. There has been a substantial increase in the number of incarceration facilities that are uh, incarcerating women. Uh, but generally speaking, we're seeing more, more male facilities closing. But one of the things that kind of I don't want to say blew our minds. We had a working hypothesis, but it was nice to validate that working hypothesis, is that overwhelmingly 57% of these counties that closed a facility have another facility in the same county, right? So this is not the story of carceral capacity disappearing in these places, but instead transition or moving of carceral capacity outside of those places. And then again, kind of coming to what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, 
private versus state. 90% of the organizations that, or of the facilities that closed were state operated, 5% uh, federal and the remaining private. So again, this is a story of state budgets, state policy making, state um, strategizing that we really wanna think about. So why are prisons closing? We're gonna argue, uh, and we do argue in the paper, that prison closures are largely located in places where prison construction was used as an economic lever for local governments, right? So this is not the story of prisons being opened in response to the crime rate, but rather what we were talking about earlier as prisons being opened as a tool uh, used by local governments. Uh, we saw local governments bid competitively for prisons during the boom. Uh, there are all sorts of um, anecdotes that people will tell you about different states that were basically engaging in a race to the bottom effect, trying to come up with the most attractive package that they could present to state authorities in order to get those prisons placed there, rather than prisons being developed in response to local demand for bed space. Over half of closures occurred in counties with more than one prisons, and these closures are really concentrated by states. So a third of closures are in three U.S. states, New York, North Carolina, and Texas. So when we compare closures in counties, counties with closures to counties with prisons but no closures, we see that closure counties are twice as large in population, they're less likely to be rural, they're richer, they're more likely to vote Democratic. And so we've seen that to date, closures have occurred in regions that are better suited to cope with the potential socioeconomic fallout of a prison closure. A lot of us in the room, as we start talking about you know, smart decarceration or responsible decarceration, are really worried about what's gonna happen to these local facilities <coughs> that don't represent this half where there is another prison in the county. But what's happening when the prison is a large major employer in a relatively rural space? So here is just going to be a table that will represent the facts that I just told you. Um, again, comparing counties with uh, prisons but no closures or counties with prisons but closures. Um, and again, showing that the closures that we've observed, the things that we can take lessons from are not necessarily the counties that we're really worried about when we talk about what is the economic fallout going to be of um, decarceration or prison closure. So what are our takeaways? Kind of what do we do with this information? We see that the prison bust is most present in regions with aggressive prison building policies during the boom. So this is places that were very cyclical and reactionary to the potential for economic development as a result of prison construction that are now closing this, right? So cyclical and reactionary means cyclical and reactionary, and we're kind of seeing the other side of that cycle. We've seen that prison closures have been largely driven by instrumental motives, uh, things like budget reduction, staffing shortages, um, and a surplus of carceral capacity, meaning that we don't necessarily need two prisons in the same county, right? So we argue that this means the prison bus should be thought of as a restructuring of the carceral state rather than a decarceration abolitionist outcome. And the prison bus has mostly occurred outside of these traditional prison towns, which means that we can try to learn things from these closures, but it's also really important to think about what we can't learn from these closures when we're trying to think about uh, more generalized prison town rural places. And that is all I have for you. I will go ahead and turn it over to our wonderful undergraduates, uh, Sarah Ogundare and Sam Theo Harris. Hi everyone, um, such a pleasure to be speaking today. I'm Sarah, this is Sam, and we're undergraduate re research scholars with Professor Eason here at Brown. Um, we're gonna be talking about a couple case studies that we've done research on as part of his prison abolitionist policy class and as part of the lab. Um, yeah, I'll pass it over to you to start. Great, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, so what we've one of the things that we've highlighted uh, in the lab and that Professor Eason has highlighted in his first book is that a lot of, largely um, the reasons that prisons get built, particularly in these rural, in these rural places, in these rural prison towns that we often think of when we think about prison towns, is because there's demand for them. So prisons are public works projects. They're often stigmatized public works projects, but they are public works projects. So they often get, um, they're often responded to initially with the, the, the classic, not in my backyard, NIMBY sort of response, where people are, uh, you know, want, might want the, the aspects of a public works project, but don't want it to be so close to them. They don't want it to have particular effects. But there, this is bar a, some particular cases in which people do want 
people do end up wanting prisons. And so that often has that often coincides with towns that have had some sort of uh, social stigma, stigmatization in terms of some sort of large event where they have a poor reputation. Um, this also uh, can increase uh, they need uh, economic opportunity, some sort of sto social stability, and prisons are also a great source of government funding, both directly in terms of the money going into the prison and then indirectly in terms of money going into uh, healthcare infrastructure and education. So when all of these come together in a perfect storm in these rural towns, we move, people tend to move from this more NIMBY attitude to a PIMBY attitude or a please in my backyard. So what this means for uh, responsible decarceration it, or abolitionist policy is that uh, we need to be curbing demand before we can be getting rid of these prisons. We need to be curbing demand for the prisons and filling the, uh, the both social, political, and economic footprint that they leave behind. I really like this clicker. Um, <laughs> Right? Yeah, I really like it. Um, so to situate this in a couple of case studies, our class specifically looked at the prison bus in California. Um, and so this, um, this means not just doing research on our own archival work, um, looking through news reports, but also interviewing members of, this com of these communities. So we studied the ways that prison closures in California sort of began in um, 2021 um, as part of this campaign, um, this progressive campaign. Um, and we specifically looked at Susanville and Bly, those two communities that um, when their prison closure was announced, because it was announced, it was not something that they had community input in. Um, when it was announced, it came as a shock um, and a lot of outrage because the prison supports a decent number of jobs in those towns. Um, I have a couple of um, statistics up on there from uh, reports in these towns. And so, um, with this loss of economic opportunity, of course, they're uh, given their reliance on the prison over so much time. Um, they they reacted with outrage, and so when we spoke to them um, and had interviews with various members of the community, it reflected that a lot of people talked about how the prison drives the community, and it's seen as one of the most reliable sources of um, economic improvement. Um, so that means not just bringing in jobs and government money, as um, Sam alluded to, um, and yeah, for example, jobs as correctional officers, but also impacts schools, hospitals, housing. Um, people talked about how family members might move to their communities if a loved one is incarcerated in a facility that's in their town. They talked about how their, um, their towns get additional funding uh, in terms of schools and hospitals because incarcerated people might be enrolled in a program in the school or might be treated by the hospital, and that allows them to further fund programs that, that, that also um, benefit their residents. Um, and at the same time, an interesting fact that we uh, learned from the community of Bly specifically was that it also sort of reproduces a level of social stratification when um, correctional officers are employed um, because of the um, because of how reliable those jobs are. They're they're seen as like a, a social they have an elevated social status compared to others in the town, um, which was really interesting. But overall, one of the main things that we heard from residents of this town is that with the prison arrival, um, which had been advertised to them as, a, again, a source of economic benefit to them, um, it led to the decline of other alternative profitable businesses like agriculture in Susanville, um, which led to increased reliance on the prison and which also contextualizes this shift from NIMBY to PIMBY as they're becoming more reliant and they have less other forms of economic development, um, they, they have more need for the prison. Yeah, so we even see that this, uh, this trend from NIMBY to PIMBY gets extended a bit further into LIMBY, into a leave it in my backyard. As we start to see these prison, these prison closures, um, we see, we've seen an uprising of uh, community organizations and community coalitions that have come together in these prison towns to fight the state um, to keep their prison because it is such a vital because it is such a vital portion of, their, of the social, political, and economic landscapes of the town. Uh, the, the people that are in these movements feel, um, and the data suggests that they're correct, that the, removing the prisons would leave the town almost entirely destitute. And so that's why we've seen, we've worked 
uh, when we were working with Blythe and with Susanville, uh, we, we did a lot of interviewing and talking to residents about the both the Save Truck campaign and the Save CCC campaign in Blythe and Susanville, respectively. Right. Um, and I'll just mention also briefly, um, when I was taking Professor Eason's class, one thing I did not expect um, were campaigns around uh, saving the prison and advocacy, self-advocacy around the prison. Um, so that was something that I definitely learned um, because it was coming at it from an angle that I didn't expect. Um, and one of the things that we talked about in class, um, I remember interviewing when we were doing research with Susanville, a superintendent of one of the schools, um, is the effect of the prison closure on, on those schools and uh, sort of flipping the uh, discourse around the school to prison pipeline on its head and thinking about the prison closure to rural school, school closure pipeline. So I have a couple of uh, quotes up here from our interviews with Blythe and, a, and I think one on the next slide from Susanville. I won't read them for the sake of time, but um, they do focus on how the school district relies on um, an incarcerated population as students um, in order to get further income and how within the schools students especially remember in the high school they talked about how they saw the pathway of becoming a correctional officer as one of the most reliable um, ways of being employed after only needing a high school diploma um, and the, I guess the desperation that a lot of these community members feel is I think articulated by the the last, oh, how does this work? There we go. Um, this last sentence, we don't have a community more anymore if all of these institutions that we've relied upon um, begin to close as a result. Um, and yeah, again, in Susanville, they have the sense that everything is going to suffer if they have um, less funding going to schools, less students in the classroom, less programs available, less pathways to dependable employment for students, and ultimately school closure is their fear as well. Uh, well, if uh, Kate is our uh, statistics nerd in residence, I'm our statistics nerd in training here at the <laughs> Justice Policy Lab. Um, so I'm going to talk through a little bit of the quantitative methods um, and how we how we uh, conceptualize our study of prison towns and their effects on schools. So first of all, we use a sort of a, a, an uncommon unit of geography when we're analyzing prison towns. We use the census place, which for those of you familiar with census data, is a wholly unwieldy unit of analysis because it doesn't, it only merges well with uh, states and the census blocks. Anything else doesn't play nicely with. But as we can see here, it's really, it's really good at getting a, a precise picture of what these prison towns look like. So this is um, this bottom line, whoops, I turned it off. There we go. Um, this bottom line here is uh, Blythe. So this is, this is just talking about median household income as a, as a proxy, right? So this bottom line is Blythe. This line is the county it resides in, Riverside County. This is the whole state of California, and this is the US. And so what you can see here is that the place of Blythe um, operates as an economic unit that, that while it's, it, it does tend to follow the trends of the county, state, and country, it tends to lag behind at, at many different points. It is trending in the opposite direction as all these other things. So this is really, I think, one of the, a very succinct example of why place is really the unit of analysis we should be using. Now, the unfortunate part about this is it doesn't drive well with districts. So we're, I'm going to walk through a little bit of how we're thinking moving forward as we begin to start our analysis on, our formal analysis on the effects on school districts. So this is North Carolina. We're going to look at North Carolina because, as Kate mentioned, it is one of the uh, three biggest states that has the most closures, m along with New York and Texas. And so this is the map of all the school districts in North Carolina. And here are all of the census places. So as you can see, they don't all line up very well. There are census places that do fall completely within districts, and there are census places that fall just at the edge. There are census places that come over the borders. There's a lot of North Carolina that doesn't fall within census places. So this leaves us with an issue of how do we reconcile this? And just to also add in there, those black dots, they're a little bit hard to see. My apologies. Those are where all of the prisons are in North Carolina. So our, our working solution to this problem right now is to create service areas. So service areas use, drive, use the road networks and drive times to map out a 20 and 25 minute uh, driving radius from each of the prisons. And so what, when we do that, it looks like this. And so each of those, 
the, the inner ring is a 20 minute drive and the outer ring, a little bit hard to tell the difference, is a 25 minute drive. And so our reasoning for this is that any, uh, any school district that is within a 25 minute of drive of a prison is at least reasonably likely to be affected by that prison's closure because it's a close enough radius where um, if people work at the prison, they may also have children that go to the school or they ha may have a spouse that works at the school etc. And so what we can do then is grab any school district that overlaps with these 20 and 25 minute radii to get our study areas. And so when we do that, this is what it looks like. And so this is what it looks like with all of the prisons. Now, there are a couple of school districts that don't visually make a whole lot of sense that they should be included in this. And we're, we're, we're working on refining this method some, so that that may change. But even if we do include these, that will, if anything, give us a conservative estimate of how uh, the impact of prison closures on schools and school districts. So thinking about how we, how we come up with policies, it's important what we've discussed is it's important to talk about and think about what the barriers of entries are for those who are most directly impacted, which usually includes rural communities when we're thinking about prison towns. Um, and it's important to create pathways for those communities to self-advocate and have their voices actually be heard. Um, because as we saw in Susanville and Bly, there are lots of cases where they want to self-advocate but are consistently ignored, which does not make sense when they're the ones experiencing the harm in the first place, um, when their prisons close and they lose that source of economic development. Um, and one thing that, at least in my research, I've been looking at is wealth inequality as a common denominator. So I'm going to speed through this a little bit because I know that we're tight on time. Um, but we have seen cases from California to New to uh, right here locally in Rhode Island where wealth inequality impacts whose voices gets, gets heard. Um, so there was a proposal for another prison to uh, be closed instead that Blythe proposed um, when they heard that their prison was slated to close when that announcement was made. And this made a lot more sense because the Norco prison um, was more poorly maintained, it was more expensive to run, um, it was not up to code, um, but their proposal was ignored because the state, the CDCR, had already decided that their prison would be closed. Um, and then a, an example from here in Providence um, that I heard about from one of the local activists here, Brandon Robinson, is about how when it comes to um, policy uh, test testifying um, at the state house, while professional usually have the opportunity to speak first. Those with a higher um, formal education degree um, are prioritized while, quote, the working person is waiting until 2 a.m., um, which has a lot of implications um, for how this state at least values those with direct lived experience and highlights why it's important to uplift their voices especially. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight that's been key for us is the importance of mixed methods. Um, so even just by comparing the research that we've done together, um, let alone the entire lab, um, the, the combination of quantitative and qualitative um, has led us to make insights that we would not have been able to otherwise. Um, and yeah, another thing I wanted to emphasize is, again, organizing around the needs of those most impacted. And in Susanville, this has implications for those who were inside the CCC, inside the prison, and outside the prison. Um, so I, I don't think I have time to go into detail about this, but uplifting the living conditions of those inside through an amicus brief um, during the Dixie fire, which was kind of a horrific fire that Susanville experienced, occurred at the same time that those in Susanville were um, realizing that they also had insufficient resources for the fire department, which is unfortunate, um, and ha they had to pull resources from out of state to deal with the Dixie fire, um, which is why one of the solutions that we came up with them, we came up with for them specifically, um, was to um, invest in a fire base, which would provide jobs as well as fill that resource, um, which leads me to, I guess, the last point I make, which is about how repurposing and upcycling the prison and upcy upcycling the place, making something better out of what the prison was, is not generalizable and has to be specified to the needs of that community. Great. And I really want I wanted to flag really quick, since we're talking about Providence, um, if anyone wants to know any more about organizing in Providence around decarceration or around the prison system, you can find me or Sarah at any time. We can either answer your questions or direct you to, to someone who can. Um, so when we talk about upcycling the place, because we know that the 
prison boom in, in rural towns was generated by this demand for prisons. It, it has to be the, what we need to curb it by curbing that demand and upcycling these, these towns in terms of economic development. So this can look a lot of different ways, but mostly it, it needs to hit on economic stability, social stability, and uh, uh, and working with communities. So this, this, can, this can include a broad range of policy solutions, including focusing on broadband infrastructure or investing in renewable energy, transportation. A lot of rural places are either have or are in close proximity to um, beautiful natural resources. And so natural parks are another like fantastic public works project, not always feasible, not always, won't always fill the exact economic footprint in terms of number of jobs, but do tend to have that same sort of stabilizing uh, effect. All right, that is what we have. Thank you very much. Um, I just need a minute. I have to open up. I don't know how to make this big. Is this fine? Is there a way to make this? Can you control L? Control L. OK, thank you. Great. OK. <clears throat> um, the clicker? Okay, great. So uh, first of all, I uh, want to thank uh, everyone at the Urban Institute, the Watson Center specifically, um, Ivy Hunter, Ellen White, Chloe Hamison, that have been amazing to bring us all here today, including myself, and really the logistical aspects of running this type of thing is immense. I've done it, so I, you know, thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Eason, John Eason, for inviting me here today and, you know, realizing this vision that um, I've heard about for many years, you know, COVID putting a wrench in this, but thank you so much. Um, so today I'm going to uh, bring in kind of um, a leading from what we've heard about in terms of understanding um, where the um, kind of the consequences of this prison boon are kind of shaping out uh, specifically within um, immigrant detention centers around the United States. Um, so this is a working paper that um, Actually, a few of you uh, have seen me present on some preliminary findings of this um, about a year ago, but we're wrapping it up, so it's exciting to, to be able to present it today. Um, relocating the Border Immigrant Detention Center placement across the prison boom from about 1980 to 2010. Um, one other thing I'm really excited about being in a space like this in a very profound interdisciplinary space. Um, I am a sociologist by training, however, I also have a policy degree um, and you know, being entrenched in the economics of this, um, but also the socio-legal aspects of this um, is really an important space to be, right? Having this interdisciplinary conversation um, is essential to really understanding what is, what is going on um, with, with um, these issues today. Um, okay, so I like to start this conversation always grounding um, my work in history. Um, so there is some recent work coming out, and you know I believe this to be very true. That um, you know I start my um, study in 1980. This is a picture of the Mariel boat lift uh, when the Cuban um, refugees were leaving Cuba in uh, mass um, over about a four-month period and um, really sparked a very strong um, visceral response here in the United States against the immigrants coming in um, and really fueled and began kind of this uh, big wave of uh, increasing immigrant detention uh, around the United States in the 1980s um, to where kind of we see today, right? With expanding infrastructure, uh, expanding um, institutional support, funding, um, to support these endeavors. Um, I will be remiss to say that this is a new phenomenon. We have been dealing with this for over a century. Um, a lot of my colleagues, my, histor my uh, historians, my friends, um, have um, really grounded this conversation you know, much, much farther back than 1980. But um, uh, since 1980, there, there really has been a fundamental shift in how it's actually shaping and reshaping itself here in the United States. Uh, both within the institution itself, but then communities as well. 
Um, so my work really uh, centers its uh, focus on uh, describing and understanding how immigrant detention has really become and evolved its own uh, evolved itself as its own form of punishment, particularly you know since the um, 1980s and arguably before then. Um, so just a bit of context, um, immigration violations in general um, and detention uh, priorly, prior have, are really civil matters for the most part, right? These are civil violations. They're not criminal violations in many, in many spaces. Um, and so there are kind of some constitutional limitations around how we understand immigration violations. Um, but uh, as we begin to uh, un unfold over the last half century, we're beginning to realize how uh, a lot of these violations are being tr treated within a, a more entrenched form of criminal punishment. Um, what I like to describe and understand uh, immigrant detention being is really an extension more recently as um, a form of the carceral system in the United States. So here I draw on a lot of theories around Foucault's carceral continuum conversation. Um, and writings uh, looking at um, incarceration and prisons in specific um, as a broader connection, uh, you know, not just as institution themselves, but really delving deeper within uh, varying levels of, um, of state, uh, including towns, counties, and US states as well. Um, and then uh, Heather Schoenfeld's carceral capacity work, which I'm very happy that she's here on the panel with us to have a conversation after we speak um, to really understand how the, the states, the U.S. states, are really um, building their support and ability to increase carceral capacity in the United States. And um, of course, immigrant detention increasingly and over time, we're finding uh, very egregious human rights violations happening within these centers. Um, Hernandez and Eason and uh, some co-authors in 2018. Um, Aldana, Professor Aldana Marquez, who is here with us today, has also written extensively on uh, documenting some of these atrocities within immigrant detention centers and how um, ind individuals themselves within these carceral spaces um, are being uh, subjected um, to very extreme forms of punishment. Um, <clears throat> So what do we know about immigrant detention within the literature? I know this is a policy conference, and I'm, I will get to that, but I, I do need to kind of help folks understand um, this, this particular research project within the larger scope of what we do know about immigrant detention as a form of punishment. So scholars for very long now, um, over two decades, have um, primary legal scholars, lawyers in the field, um, have begun to document how immigration law and criminal, crim, uh, criminal law have really become much more entwined within uh, both uh, within the legislation itself, um, within the institutions such as immigrant detention centers, prisons, jails, um, but then also within the, cr the procedural processes, right? How these things are, are happening and going through the court systems, um, how individuals are navigating themselves through both um, immigration legal proceedings as well as criminal uh, legal proceedings, depending on the cases that are there at hand. Um, and I'll, what we know, and how people have named this, right, this is the crimigration, right, era, era of the literature. Uh, a lot of you, I see you nodding, so you kind of know. So this is very deeply entrenched in the legal doctrine and understanding the law and how legal pro and the, um, the, the legislation has evolved to, to have this, um, this new form of crimigration um, operating in our in uh, communities and, and states today. What we also know about immigrant detention is there is extensive work uh, looking at case and comparative studies. So individuals actually getting access into these facilities. It's very few, it's very hard. Um, I myself as a graduate student attempted to, um, you know, go through the IRB process and try to get into the local immigrant detention center in Dodge County in Wisconsin. And ICE was, uh, you know, a big brick wall there trying to get in. So it's, it's very hard to access these facilities on the inside. Um, there are initiatives that are happening um, to provide expanded legal services on the inside where institutions um, such as the Vera Institute are doing great work to support um, increasing legal services within these institutions. So there's, there's few but some work on uh, case and comparative studies. Um, there's extensive, an extensive body of literature examining the political economy and the historical development of these institutions across time and across place. Um, I list some of the authors here. 
And then probably most important for my conversation today is um, looking at the, cause, the causes and consequences of this expanding detention center network within the United States. So some of the forefront um, uh, thinkers on this is Moin Sedar. She's actually released a um, uh, very interesting piece in AJS um, this year around looking at immigrant detention center um, um, immigrant detainment across the United States, and then, of course, Rio and Peacock's series of work around this issue. Um, there are limitations to some of this, and we still know, we still don't know a lot about what is happening here, and so what our work is trying to do is um, really elevate some of this uh, conversation in a uh, distinct and, and uh, more precise way. So kind of looking at immigrant detention centers and comparing this with prison openings, um, what this paper is trying to do and what we've been trying to do for a number of years is understand and really begin to document this relationship with immigrant detention center placements and prisons, right? Um, Victoria did a great job <laughs> of explaining the prison boom, and so we have that here in the orange uh, in terms of, so these are the number of openings, sorry about the labels, on the left. Um, across time, right, since about 1980. So as we see, right, there is the prison boom happening, speaking in the 1980s. And then as we begin, and we've talked about this already, there is a documented uh, prison bust, and we see that happening here in this graph as well. Most interestingly, uh, based on the preliminary data that um, I'm drawing on, although, um, again, this is arguably difficult and, and incomplete in itself, um, we see evidence of a uh, potential detention center uh, boom, right, or increase, kind of supplanting uh, what we see uh, with this decline in prison buildings over time. And that's the, the blue bars right there. Um, so what is immigrant detention center placement? Um, I think it's important to understand and um, really be clear that um, we're talking about two fundamental different systems here. Prisons, jails are institutions, they're buildings, they're brick and mortar places. Immigrant, det immigrant detention centers are not as easily understood, right? Um, so they can be a mix of standalone ICE facilities and also temporal contracts with existing carceral facilities in themselves. They're typically contractual agreements with ICE and the federal government and local carceral entities to specifically house and detain immigrants. They're mixed use facilities in many, in many cases. They, these contracts often detail out per diem costs to house, transport, and manage the security of these immigrant detainees. They're reviewed and approved regularly, typically on a yearly basis with ICE. And these contracts can be signed indefinitely or for a fixed period of time. So this is an example of one of them just to give you um, a sense of kind of what they might look like, right? Oops. I have to kind of run a little bit uh, faster. I think I'm a bit slow here. Um, so what is the relationship? My questions here, what, are the, what is the relationship between places, so towns, with detention centers um, and the demographic, demographic characteristics of these towns, the economic characteristics, and um, whether or not these places have an existing prison? So it's important to talk about data here. The data. It's very difficult to get on this. Um, ICE is not an easy um, institution to work with, and uh, advocacy organization, Easton has led, been part of this as well, have been trying over 15 years to get regular data. We're now at that point where ICE is actually publishing this data more regularly, which is great. But this data comes from a FOIA request um, that coded about 246 facility level data that we geocoded to the US Census Place, and it does, um, provide year facility and contract initiation dates. We use the prison proliferation policy um, data. I'm um, sorry, that says that UW-Madison. I, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> and then our decennial census estimates. I'll go real quickly. Um, so I use a cross-sectional rare event logistic regression. Why cross-sectional? You know, a lot of robust studies use longitudinal panel data. I'm using cross-sectional data because I do believe there is very important periods of times at the decades that we need to map out and understand, linking it with policies, linking it with laws, linking with prison building to really see how there has been this dramatic change across decades, right? What is it across the decades that we are, um, that is changing over time? The N is about 25,000 plus, and this is a model for one of the, uh, uh, um, 
uh, regression estimates. So again, um, here we have a nasty little table. The nice thing here is to look at these last two columns, right? The percentage changes from 1980 to 2010. Um, here we have towns with detention centers and prisons. So if obviously there's been dramatic increases uh, in the number of detention centers and then over 700% increase in places that um, have a prison and a detention center across the United States. For the economists in the room, you love these types of tables. Um, these are my rare event logistic results. I think, again, I have a lot of noise here, but we're, what we're finding is that there is a positive relationship with um, prisons um, over time and increasingly, right? Um, and um, I'll kind of put these in words later, but uh, we see these towns have more Hispanic populations, uh, greater poverty, um, although uh, rural towns are not kind of seen this type of similar trajectory, and, um, and uh, it's increasing, right, from 1980 to 2000. I have a lot of noise in the 2010 stats, so I'm, I'm a little bit worried about putting those out there. Okay, so policy impl implica implications. Um, there's a range, right? Um, first and foremost should always be international policy. Uh, a lot of migration um, is a result of very long-standing policy decisions made by the United States into affected regions, specifically uh, Central and South America, that is really pushing migrants, um, not just in the Americas, but around the world into the United States, that's creating a demand on these systems. There's a lot of national policy implications that can happen, things like a call to end ICE. Um, we've had uh, very high profile politicians pushing these agendas, um, and of course, comprehensive immigration reform. But most importantly, and I will argue, uh, local level responses is kind of where we really need to be entrenched in uh, as we continue these conversations. Um, we can talk about an end to ICE in the dialogue. Here are some images around, around what this might mean. Comprehensive immigration reform, I'm a, very, I'm a big skeptic on this. I know this is where the politicians and um, our immigrant advocates, so to speak, um, really want to lay, and this is the answer, right, we have. We hear this often. I'm very skeptical of this. Um, I can talk about more about that why in um, the legislation. Um, but what we do know is CRR legislation has been introduced repeatedly and over time since the early 2000s, and it's only getting worse. So where um, I have to wrap this up, but um, where I find the uh, most exciting and most interesting and the places where the researchers and advocates really need to be spending and focusing their time at is at the subnational level. So here's an example of the recent SB4 law in Texas, right, that um, is, you know, hotly being debated right now in public and in uh, the Supreme Court. Um, and we have the sheriff here, Richard Wiles from San Antonio, uh, talking about the challenges his institution specifically will have. Um, a great quote from this article, they are shifting the cost of the federal issue to local taxpayers, Weil said, adding that the costs for secure borders should be on every taxpayer in the nation, not just those who live along the border, right? So here we're, we're talking about this is not just a national issue, but really this is entrenched in the local uh, politics around and uh, communities around the country. Another potential policy that I always like to uh, talk about, uh, the criminologists in the room will understand this as alternatives to incarceration, but alternatives to detention is a potentially a way to kind of ease the strain um, of uh, these detention center places um, around, the, around the country. Um, so these are practices that ensure that individuals are not detained for reasons that are related specifically right to their migration status. Okay, and I'll end here. Um, this is a, um, a map, so you can see and just be, it's kind of, Hard to see, but the red dots, um, these are detention centers um, around, and you can see very clearly, and uh, overlaid with prisons in the black, you can see very clearly that this is obviously not a border issue, but one that's really uh, kind of permeated within and throughout the United States and in our communities. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Well, the early <laughs>
Yeah. Uh, so again, I'm Heather Schoenfeld. I'm an associate professor at Boston University, and I've been studying the problem of mass incarceration uh, for quite a while. Um, what I want to do today is put uh, carceral capacity into a larger context and kind of expand how we're thinking about carceral capacity from where we started here at this panel. And I think hopefully this will relate to the panels that we're going to hear for the rest of the day. Um, so when I began to study the causes of mass incarceration in the US many years ago, uh, my research and uh, the researchers of many others in this room were building on a first generation of studies that examined how shifts in national politics, national economy, and culture led policymakers to respond to crime and people's fear of crime with punitive sanctions and prison. But as the second generation of scholars began digging into more specific histories at the state and local level, we realized we had to look at the decisions that made mass incarceration possible, um, not just the wider conditions. As I argue in my book, Building the Prison State, in order to funnel millions of people through our criminal legal systems each year, we need certain state capacity, enough police officers, courts, probation offices, prison cells, and so on. As I studied the growth of incarceration, particularly in Florida, I found that before the state could get tough on crime, it invested millions of federal, state, and local dollars into all levels of the criminal legal system, from policing to courts to prisons, mostly between the 1960s and the early 1990s. These were absolutely intentional decisions. And these investments, as we've heard from this panel about the boom in prisons, they didn't just happen in Florida, of course, they happened all over the country. Um, and as Caitlin points out, they did happen at different rates. Um, so we heard how both um, California and Oklahoma, two states of very different sizes, built each built 40 plus prisons, right? So I don't know what Oklahoma is doing with all that prison space. Um, and as Isabel reminds us, at the federal level at the same time, uh, we invested in immigrant detention centers. So these investments created carceral capacity, what I define in my book as the human material and bureaucratic resources dedicated to detecting, apprehending, processing, and punishing those we deem criminal. Right, and this, again, there's this blurring of the line between um, civil and criminal, and we, you know, we argue that immigrant detention centers and how we're viewing immigrants is through this same lens of criminal. Um, but I want to also expand this idea, because it's not just physical resources that we're talking about here. Um, it's not just prisons. It includes things such as bureaucracies, staff and administrative positions, data management systems, protocols for coordination across these systems, um, and much more. Right? We need all of this capacity um, to do what we're doing now. So we got a, a big picture from our panel about what this prison boom looked like, and we're starting to get a picture about what the bust looks like. Um, but it's important when we look back at the historical t context that we understand who is making these decisions. Um, and importantly, it's in the 1960s and, 1960 and 1970s, we found that it was criminal justice reformers, including progressives, who advocated for many of the initial investments in carceral capacity. These investments were meant to fix what they saw as a broken system. Later, um, these investments became economic growth and development for rural communities. Um, but we need to look at policymakers, right, to see how this was facilitated. 
So I want to talk a little bit more about what, why carceral capacity matters. Um, it matters for creating, not just creating the prison boom, but for sustaining the current system. Um, and uh, Caitlin mentioned how uh, in their data set they find that uh, construction of prisons actually precedes increases of incarceration or incarceration rates. So let's talk a little bit about why that might happen. So first, carceral capacity creates political and economic interests in maintaining the system. These include law enforcement, prison uh, communities, as, we, as we've heard here, and the hundreds of thousands of people employed by the system. Um, so we are also now getting a sense of what happens when we take that capacity away and how it may harm or damage schools, kids' education, and so on. Um, so we need to think, though, broadly, not just about these material benefits, um, but about the cultures that it has created, right? So when we talk about political interests or economic interests, it's not just, you know, I need investments for my school. It's also, you know, people have built their identities, right? People have built their worldviews around um, prisons and carceral capacity. Second, Carceral capacity steers policy solutions to more of the same. So particularly in moments that call for immediate action, like a rise in violent crime, for example, or less immediate things like changes in the economic system. Um, and as Sam and Sarah note, uh, because there's been investments in communities in prisons, there hasn't been investments in other things, um, it steers uh, Paul, you know, so we look to the capacity that's there, right? So policymakers turn to capacity that already exists. Um, in this case, trying to hold on to prisons. Um, but we can also see that we're seeing now sort of a turn back to the tough on crime type of rhetoric and policy um, because that's what's there. It's a known capacity, right? Um, and that's very different than, for example, investing in community organizations with less of a known capacity, um, even though all the research, of course, shows um, that this is not uh, what we need to be investing in. Um, so one thing I, I want to make clear is that uh, decisions to invest in carceral capacity um, are not the same thing as, def as uh, investments in the things that will reduce crime. So at the same time that we were investing in carceral capacity, we were not investing in things such as education, right? We were not investing in quality health care. We were not investing uh, in... Um, uh, sorry, in other uh, things that w are actually known to reduce crime. Okay, so I will quickly get to the end. So that's what I'm going to say. Hmm. Okay. So for the last six years, uh, myself and my co-author Michael Campbell have studied attempts to reduce state prison populations in six states. Um, and we find that the policies that have the most impact are not alternatives to incarceration, such as diversion programs. They're not reentry programs that are designed to reduce recidivism. Um, what we have concluded is that um, we simply cannot unravel mass incarceration and address the harms of incarceration by creating new capacities within our criminal legal system. Right? The things that the policies that are reducing capacity are policies that simply increase the number of people who are released from prison, reduce the number of people on parole or probation that go back to prison, um, and um, shorten prison lengths. Right? There, that's how we get to this uh, bust that we're talking about here. Um, of course, um, this creates a tension, right? The tension that was brought up here. 
So um, on one hand, we want to reduce capacity. On the other hand, we see that it has negative consequences and increases inequality in certain communities. Um, we also need to think about as we reduce capacity and reduce spending, what happens to conditions inside prisons. So arguably, our prisons right now are worse off than they were in 1970 when a whole cadre of civil rights lawyers started suing prisons. Um, they are understaffed, they are dangerous, people are not receiving health care, um, and, and we need to, to think about that as well. Um, I'm running out of time, um, but I w just wanted to say that, of course, you know, the question for us is how do we get there, right? This inertia um, and these interests are going to continue, and so I hope what we can hear today is not just policy solutions, right, what it is we should be doing, but how it is we can get there. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna take audience questions. Do you want me to sit here? Um, okay, we have some time for questions. Um, we have a mic getting passed around. Oh, over here. Go ahead, you can start if you want. Um, thank you so much, this was absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, thank you. Now that people online can hear me as well. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, this is, I, I think, in part a question for Sarah and, and Sam, um, uh, because it sounds like you may have been among those who actually talked to folks on the ground um, defending uh, the residents. Uh, so, you know, it, I, across the panels, right, we have this economic issue, right, of the investment in the prisons and the importance economically to local communities. Uh, integrated throughout the ecosystem of those communities, uh, but also, and, and Heather was hitting on this in, in her notes at the end, this cultural element around it as well, identities are wrapped up in it. Um, I was thinking a lot about Paul Willis's Learning to Labor, uh, which had implications for deindustrialization as industrial jobs were uh, you know, shutting down and people were losing their identities um, and, and not being sure what to do with it. Uh, but I wonder if there's opportunity, uh, I was thinking about one of the quotes um, uh, uh, from uh, one of the, the, the workers who was saying, I hate my job, um, but it pays really well. Uh, so one of my colleagues, uh, Natasha Frost, uh, has been focusing in recent years, her early work was all on kind of ending mass incarceration from the perspective of those incarcerated, uh, that it's terrible. Um, but her recent work is focused on, it's also terrible to work in prisons. Um, uh, the jobs suck. Um, they really do. Uh, uh, one of the, a lot of her work these days uh, focuses on the incredibly shockingly high uh, suicide rates um, among correctional officers. Uh, and when she started focusing on that, she was thinking, well, you know, I mean, it's dehumanizing to work in a prison, you know, and that would be the, that actually wasn't the, the biggest thing. The biggest thing was the job itself is terrible, right? Uh, the hours are really bad. Uh, if someone doesn't show up for their next shift because of the security functions of it, you have to stay on, even if you were supposed to pick your kid up at school, right? Even if you'd promised your partner that, you know, you were going to pick them up at school. So people got divorced, uh, they whatever. So I'm wondering if you heard any openness, right? Uh, to that among people. And again, that one quote was what, you know, gave me hope <laughs> that, right, I hate my job, but, right, uh, uh, from, you know, the interviews that you did, did you feel like there might be an openness to a change in that culture, a change in that uh, uh, identity, if a better economic, um, you know, uh, model presented itself, so. Oh, like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Try it. I'm just going to keep talking. I'm going to eat your hand. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, but I will start to answer um, and just mention uh, when I took Professor Eason's class last spring, we watched a documentary that was from the perspective of, um, or it focused on a few correctional officers and how they came into the job, um, 
and how there was a lot of hesitancy around it because it was not something that they wanted to do. Um, they talked a lot about how it uh, put a lot of strain on their relationships, like because you said, um, if there is any sort of incident at the prison, they have to stay and work overtime. Um, they can't be there for the people in their lives and for their communities. Um, aside from the fact that the work itself is not something that they ever imagined themselves doing, but it's more of a position that they've been forced into. So I do think, especially for folks who um, were in these towns before the prison was there, um, they've seen this shift um, in uh, I guess attitude of like those in their communities um, and a shift in their relationships because of um, yeah just like the way that that, that reliance has, has shaped that. Um, I do think that a lot of folks see uh, they have like they have imaginative um, like capacity for a world beyond this because one of the questions that we always ask in our interviews is like um, what would you Oh, I can't remember specifically what it was, but it, it prompted them to like imagine something new for their community without the prison. Um, and a lot of them talked about the things that they have pride in in their communities. Um, one of those things being, like we said, like the natural resources, the beauty. That's the, one of the things that drew a lot of them to the town in the first place. So there is a desire to um, have the centerpiece of the town, have the town be rooted in something other than the prison. Um, but I think yeah, because of the like current economic reliance, a lot of folks don't see any other sustainable way to do that. I think giving alternatives is helpful for that. And I also have hope that um, because of the fact that a lot of them don't truly want to be doing this job anyway, at least in my opinion, um, yeah, I think there's hope for, for something new. Uh, yes, I have uh, questions for Sam and Sarah, as well as for Isabel. So Sam and Sarah, you mentioned that your centroids uh, were based on a 20 to 25 minute drive. And I was wondering how you came up with that number and whether or not it might be more defensible, for instance, since you're already working with census data to just get, you know, people's, you know, drive times in those communities mm -hmm. and average them as a more precise measure, especially given that you're looking at rural contexts uh, for these prisons. And then Isabel, I had a question, like could you talk a little bit more about your findings because the figures that were being shown, a lot of the, the estimates look like they spanned zero and a number of the comparisons between rural and urban look like they overlapped. And so I was wondering which associations um, that you were measuring were more meaningful than others. Yeah, so um, with the 20 to 25 minute drive times, those, those, are, um, th those are numbers that we came up with uh, working with Dr. Eason. They're, they're, they are a little bit arbitrary, um, just in terms of sketching out the initial picture of it. I think that refining that with the actual drive times for those communities would be a really helpful thing in the next iteration before we before we run the analyses. Um, we've, we've been also working uh, with, uh, I didn't get a chance to cover this, but we've also been thinking about a number of uh, other ways to categorize school districts um, in terms of uh, adding in population centroids instead of drive times or taking school districts with a certain percentage of the area of uh, of the places overlapping with them instead of using drive times. Um, so this was this was just a sort of a rough preliminary uh, gauge of it, but I, I really appreciate that uh, contribution because I would very much like to refine it with that way. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. And um, you know, I think because of the nature of the conversation, I had to kind of gloss over the findings, right? This was, I, I think I spent too much time on the, the actual study and not enough on the policy, <laughs> the policy implications. So I'm, I um, thank you for the question. But so yeah, I think it definitely there, the, the trends are very close to zero. And, and the, the ones that I saw that I showed really, again, recall this is a decennial cross-sectional uh, analysis, right? So I'm looking basically snapshots in time for those that um, you know, aren't statistics. Uh, people. Um, so looking at what's happening in these places in 1980 and how the decade following is, is predicting some of that. How does it look in 1990? How does it look in 2000? And how does it look in 2010? 
And um, what I'm seeing, and you'll see in that in those couple first uh, graphs, that there are very close to zero in 1980 and 1990, because what we do see is there is a much like a greater increase of immigrant detention center placements probably after into the new century, right, into the 21st century. And, um, and so the findings really are pointing toward increasing places with Hispanic Latino populations increasingly over time. Um, economically, um, higher unemployment rates of, over time. And then the greatest find, uh, and um, the log total population as well. Um, and then the biggest finding is the prison placement, right? So what we're finding is that there is a very strong predictor of immigrant detention center placement where there's already an existing prison. So that's kind of the, the concrete strongest finding I have. We have a question right down here. Oh, okay, great. Thank you for uh, really interesting presentations. I wanted to ask um, specifically about this sort of like rural demand for carceral investment that came up a couple of times. Um, and I guess the idea that we must address that demand was kind of like shocking to me as a thing that uh, we were sort of thinking about. I understand that that is like a consequence of trying to decarcerate, for example, but I'm just curious like, what is the nature of the standing that these rural communities have to like? have that demand be acted on? Or I guess presumably communities um, where the people who are incarcerated are from also have needs mm -hmm. for economic development as well. And so why are we not deploying extreme policing in rural communities and then arresting those people, warehousing their residents in those other communities and then paying those people to dominate them? So like, this is, like the demand is itself not impetus to act. I'm just curious like, where the nature of the specific standing that we attribute to these folks um, is versus like, other places with those same concerns, but not the same kind of cultural investment. Thank you. All right, can we hear, can we hear me? Awesome, um, excellent question. So I think one thing that's worth clarifying is when I refer to local demand for prisons, I'm not thinking of it as demand in terms of um, demand for bed space, but thinking of it as demand for investment. And I think you're, you're right, and um, I tell my students all the time, and they get really frustrated with me when I'm like, no, it's both and, right? We need to be able to spend money in both places, right? Both in the places where the prisons are located, where by decreasing carceral capacity, there is some surplus labor, surplus land, these surplus things that um, people need in order to live functional lives. But we also need to be spending money uh, in the places where folks who are being incarcerated are coming from. Um, and in a world of finite budgets, uh, both and is, is a hard thing to sell on. Um, and I don't think that it's clear at this point um, which is first, which is more important, which happens. Um, I think from a social equity perspective, like supporting the folks who would be otherwise incarcerated by creating these alternatives, alternative programming, which Isabel was talking about, um, or creating support structures, like really building that infrastructure is necessary prior to thinking about decarceration. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently has been the uh, decriminalization of all drug use in Oregon, uh, which is a super interesting, fascinating policy, um, really like cool experiment, but arguably Oregon was one of the worst places to do it, right? It was second last, second, second from the bottom in the nation in terms of um, drug treatment centers, in terms of access to syringe exchange programs and kind of these things that would actually support people. And so my, my take is always like, we need to be thinking five, 10 years in the future. How can we set things up? And perhaps that is to your point, uh, spending the money in the communities of origin rather than thinking about um, how to do economic development in prison towns. But thank you for the question. Uh, can I just add something there? <laughs> so um, <clears throat> many of us here have been involved in an organization called Racial Democracy C Criminal Justice Network. And it is not by chance that it is called racial democracy, right? So one of the, the main things that we need to look at is the state of our democracy and who is at the table, right? And so those rural communities have a different place at the table um, and de depending on the community, right? As John shows us, a lot of those communities are poor. Many of them are, are uh, majority black or um, uh, uh, Latino. But um, it is very clear 
right? That as we were building prisons, what people were doing were, was explicitly taking people from urban communities and putting them in rural communities. Um, I have a quote in my book from a, from a policymaker who says, this was, the, this was the deal we came up with. Everybody understood what we were doing. Right? This was intentional. And so we have to look at, yes, power dynamics in the, in the policy process. Okay, uh, we had, Nicole has a question. Hey, hey. Um, this is for um, Isabel, but also it could be any of the panelists. I was in Chicago on the OWL and I saw this collision of two worlds. One was several homeless people sitting on the OWL um, and, and having mental health. Uh, episodes like screaming at the top of their lungs and swearing and at the exact time the doors opened on the owl um, a family someone who was an, an immigrant um, that was just kind of placed in Chicago um, was there father and son the child was terrified he was like four years old he's like you could see him and the dad was like it's okay they're selling candy these are people that would have been in detention and now we've been someone in some ways made a child and a dad homeless in Chicago in like the brutal cold. I've seen it in jails where they make you free but they punish you through freedom. No coats, get jumped, you know, all these other things. And so I guess I want, we, you know, there's a, something so terrible about immigrant detention but the option of like dumping families on like city streets with nothing. I mean, I, I had not seen it in Chicago because I hadn't been back. So. In your policy solutions, can we can we talk a little bit about that? Because when we when we do release people, there is a particular cruelty in that release. Even wrongfully convicted people get no resources to reintegrate. Professor Miller right now writes about this beautifully. Right, there's a cruelty in the freedom. So I'm wondering, can we talk a little bit about that? Because yeah, um, we can talk about it. But, but <laughs> this, homes, so, this is a terrible thing. so this is a and I knew this question was going to come up. And this is a um, a very complicated issue and, and there's no really good policy answer. I think a lot of the answers are um, pointing to action on the federal government and I agree that definitely has to happen. But I also think, or and I also think, um, there, there is a tremendous local response that needs to be put in place, not just at um, you know governmental local levels but also community level. Um, and um, it is a tragedy, right? And and I and I'm from Chicago, and I um, talk to people in Chicago now, and it's it's creating divisions in places and conversations that we've tried to dismantle for decades, and now it's creating these huge problems, like you know, amongst community members to address address what's going on with these very um, precarious populations, unhoused um, immigrant populations that are being um, unprepared and, and dumped, right? Um, most uh, because of um, decisions made by southern border states to make the northern states pay, right, or deal with the problems without preparing them, right. So there, so I believe there has to be much more coordination locally. There has to be much more coordination across states, so that when people do uh, get moved up to um, places like Chicago, from you know uh, places that are warmer, they're prepared. So I, I work with um, some some community-based organizations in Chicago um, who meet people at the bus stops, for example, right, and they come off and they have signals. You know, people come off without shoelaces, or they don't come with um, belts, or they come in shorts. So they're trained to kind of meet people as they arrive. Um, I think some, type, some of these coordinated efforts are very important and essential, because it's just, it's not enough for the government to step in and fix it all, right? We do need community-based organizations. We need, we need faith-based organizations that have a history in doing this work. And um, frankly, are not. I don't see really stepping up in the way that they need to do in places like Chicago. Um, so I, it's a complicated issue. It's not something that's easily answered in two minutes today. Um, but it's something that I believe has to be not just the federal or the state or the government, but a really coordinated effort across all of these institutions. Well, I'm told we need to wrap it up. <laughs> so um, I just want to give a hand to our panelists. Thank you so much. Wait, not this. <laughs>
I thought I was going to give you guys a bathroom break, but uh, we've eaten into that. So, no, you can't go. You must stay. No. Uh, I was going to give everyone a bathroom and coffee break, but I don't think we can do it in two and a half, three minutes. So, I want to have the next panelist start to come up and have the... Uh, have um, have the discussant introduce them. If you need to run into the restroom now, I would go ahead and do that. Uh, I want to thank everyone online as well. We're going to try and do a little bit better at fielding your questions and integrating them. Uh, so we're going to start in about two minutes. So if you're on the next panel, come on up. Right. But no, but like I, I'm right. there on that Monday, right. so like, okay, yeah, I love it. Right. <laughs> yeah, so like, yeah, 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 I mean, or like we talk about, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I won't even need all ten. <laughs> so you can make it up in my discussant. <laughs> 
All right, I think we're going to begin. I think we're going to resume, I should say, rather than begin. Hello, everyone. I think we're going to resume the symposium. Uh, hi, I am Brian Sykes from Cornell University, and I have the privilege of introducing our next panel titled Abolition as Policy. Uh, this panel has a number of everyone been doing fantastic work in this area. Uh, first is Monica Bell, professor of law and an associate professor of sociology at Yale University. Uh, next is Faith Deckard, a doctoral candidate in sociology at UT Austin and an incoming assistant professor of sociology at UCLA. Um, next, we have Susila Guruswamy, uh, an assistant professor of criminology, law, and justice at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And then last but certainly not least is Demarcus Jenkins, assistant professor of social policy at the University of Pennsylvania. Monica? Slides. No slides for me, um, <laughs> but uh, I will try my best to stick to the 15 minutes because there lo there's a lot to talk about. So I want to quickly uh, say a couple of words just thanking everyone who brought us together. It's so wonderful to be here among friends, new friends, old friends, um, who are working on these important issues and it's really humbling to be a part of this community. Um, second, I, I wanna quickly say a, a word about some of my research into, uh, before moving into, more squarely into the policy conversation. Uh, so uh, uh, for the last, I think about 12 years, now is more than a decade, it's making me feel really old. Um, I've been uh, working on issues, basically uh, conducting qualitative research um, in, uh, in black neighborhoods um, uh, with black people, talking about their experiences, not just with the police, but with the legal systems, interlocking legal systems writ large. And that's really important because my orientation toward this research is not so much about what we do with the criminal system, it's instead about how all of these systems fit together in the larger story of, of what I've referred to in my research as legal estrangement. I'll say a little bit more of a word about what that means momentarily. Um, but so some of that research has been participatory research in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I've also done research in DC, which is where I was a legal aid attorney before um, going to grad school. Uh, uh, about mothers and how they kind of p navigated this complex relationship between policing and social systems. Uh, some of what I'm going to talk about relates to some more recent projects I've been involved with, with some larger ones. Um, so one um, is a project that I was working on with Catherine Beckett and Forrest Stewart um, between 2020 and 2022 related to LEAD in Seattle, which at the beginning of that time was called law enforcement assisted diversion, has had a number of different iterations um, over the last several years. And I think that that program speaks to what I'm gonna talk about in, in a minute about uh, the kind of complexity of moving between, kind of from, from here to there and what the, the there is. Um, and then fourth, I wanna um, br briefly talk about um, so some work I was involved with with the NYU Policing Project, uh, which has focused on alternative emergency response. So alternatives to 911, some of what um, uh, Heather briefly mentioned in her comments during the last panel, um, and say a little bit more about some of the, the nuts and bolts and tricky pieces of, of a lot of these alternatives and kind of Again, policies that try to move us from here to there. So in terms of my theoretical orientation, uh, the big kind of both question and theoretical commitment of my research has been this idea that I've referred to as legal estrangement. And the key move, uh, in my opinion at least, is that it tries to turn the lens from why people and groups don't trust or are cynical about police and institutions um, of public safety, so to speak, and welfare, and instead to look at how these institutions exclude or exchange groups 
from their rightful claim over the state, which changes the nature of the interpretation of data, I think. So it's like, instead of what do we do to make this institution, to, to kind of convince people to trust this institution, instead the question is, how do we make this institution less exclusionary, which is not assuming that trust is the goal and is kind of take, taking um, seriously the sense and reality of social exclusion that emerges from how we uh, make legal uh, and institutional arrangements. Um, and uh, so, so, so that's the key sort of move. Now, uh, one of the reasons I'm presenting without slides and focusing mostly on the policies is because I'm a legal scholar. So like, it's like I teach at a law school. Um, and, uh, and so one of the things that's really important in the legal scholarship world is to think seriously about prescriptions and, and the politics of them. Uh, so, uh, so what I want to do is highlight three solutions that uh, – and, and I don't want to call them solutions because they're not really solutions. They're just mechanisms that people have proposed to get us from here to there um, in, in the kind of policy world. And so first is what I've already alluded to, which is this alternative emergency response. So a lot of these models um, kind of kicked off in 2020 in the post-murder uh, of George Floyd era, modeled on cahoots in Oregon, which, um, as we know, is, this, is probably a lot of you are watching already know, um, is a, a, a program that um, basically has people who are not police respond to mental people in mental health crises. And so there's kind of an alternative number you would call or something like that. Now, one of the things that's really important is that the, a lot of the ways a lot of the models that have been used around the country on these pilot programs are very, very different from each other. And these very different types of models have real serious implications for how they would actually work. So for example, in one of the places where the research is taking place, and I want to highlight here particularly the work of Jessica Galuli, who's a researcher who is focused on the kind of the, kind of the, the police <laughs> decision makers in these models. Um, so. Uh, so one question is, how many hours of the day is this program available? Um, why is this important? Like, really nuts and bolts, but really important for understanding the true availability of an alternative. If someone has a mental health crisis, uh, crisis late at night, then and the police come then um, and not these alternative um, responders, that's a real serious implication for how we can even understand the potential efficacy of a policy like this. Um, another um, example is, you know, uh, like what, um, like what uh, sort of, like what is the mechanism when calls arrive? So like, do they, is there a separate number or are numbers being called, is, is, do they call 911 and then on the basis of some kind of decision making tree, the, the call goes to kind of a couple of workers who are, are tasked with dispatching the social service people instead of the police. Uh, this has really serious implications for, like that, that person, that first person who's on the decision tree has a lot of power in determining whether an alternative response even actually occurs. And these are the types of nuts and bolts things we need to look at. Um, the biggest one, actually, in my opinion at least, is what's the trigger for when a police officer has to be involved, has to, is, is, is really loaded language, but, but, but um, we're gonna go with it because this is how a lot of these pilots actually work. Um, so the idea is that if there's not a danger there, like if there's no weapon, then you would root um, the person uh, to uh, this alternative, but if there's some kind of risk, potential risk involved for the social workers and how risk is, is defined is very broad, then there might need to be a police officer there and you don't really get the meaningful alternative response. Why is this important? Well, I have in my mind very much this morning when Rosario, who is a young man who is having a health crisis in New York City where I live, um, and the NYPD shows up after his mother calls because he's in mental health crisis. And somehow there's, there's a very disputed set of events. Um, uh, but at the end, uh, what they can agree on is that when Rosario had scissors and these scissors 
were deemed threatening enough by the NYPD to ultimately kill him in that moment while he was being held by his mother. Now, uh, so we hear that and we, and, and so like an, an easy response if you're in the kind of emergency of the alternative response world would be, well, why were police there? Why weren't there social workers there or something like that? You know, like, like what, what's, what was, what, what else could have been there? Um, sure. Uh, but the question is, are scissors a weapon? Like, or like, how do we think about scissors? This is a really, really nuts and bolts question that has real implications for the efficacy of this policy. Now I realize after I said I'm not going to take 15 minutes, I'm at risk of breezing past that. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I'm, we're still number one, but number two. <laughs> so, uh, interventions, interventions like LEAD um, that, that uh, directly attack, uh, tackle what some people call behavioral health, but what I might prefer to uh, call something like human suffering on the street, uh, something like that, some, some this more like recognizing of what's really happening. Programs like this are really important for the politics of public safety. So this is a point that I wanted to make sure to get to, because I don't, I, I can't live, like I have to live in the real world. And one of the things I've learned about the real world right now is that we are operating in a culture that is deeply antithet antithetical to abolitionist practice. Even like a quick, just a quick example that is probably too fun given how little time I have left, but how many of you like the movie American Fiction or saw the movie American Fiction? People love this movie, but one of the things that I noted about it is um, there's, there's a couple of scenes where defund and abolition are mentioned, and they're mentioned specifically as a joke, like that there is a Brooklyn-based white woman who is like, defund abolition, you just don't know enough about it. And then the black person is like, what are you talking about? This is a joke, which made it harder for me to like the movie. But, <laughs> one of the things is, but, 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 but it reflects something so deep about one of the serious challenges we have in even having this conversation, which is there's a lot of realism to the actual practical world of doing abolitionist, both organizing and policy making. But that's not understood by in our political discourse. And that's a real problem. So there are, so I think one of the questions we have to confront in conversations about abolitionist policy is the moving from here to there and taking seriously liminal policies that might not actually be abolitionist in their orientation. And I think LEAD is actually a really interesting example of this. One of the fascinating things about studying LEAD was how many people involved with the actual doing of LEAD identified as being radical or abolitionists in their hopes and dreams, but confronted with the reality of having to coordinate with different occupational cu cultures to achieve their goals. So having to work with prosecutors who do not, who are like, we need to have a retributivist mindset or, or judges who are like the only way to deter you is to have this backstop of the criminal system. And so there are real questions about how to have an abolitionist politics while working in a program like that, that doesn't, that where not everyone has those goals. But that's a really serious question, like how much of, like, like how, how much of that is what you need to do to deal with real world problems on the ground versus whether that is, and I'm just kind of sliding into the third point here, um, whether that is kind of a project of legitimation. So this legitimation is something that abolitionists worry and think about a lot. Um, you know, this idea that you can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. But there's a second part of that Audre Lorde quote where she also says, you might also, like there might be some temporary wins that can come from that. And so what I want to propose today is that we actually need a structure by which we are engaged in projects that, that achieve temporary wins while also keeping our eye on the arc of abolition, and there has to be serious conversation and coordination around working along all those poles, but the politics of that are really hard. Um, in my last less than two minutes, um, another um, piece I wanted to highlight uh, 
of this. Um, I don't have enough time to talk about structural reform litigation, but it, it kind of is operating from the same idea, which is that even like, so structural reform litigation, so pursuing uh, uh, consent decrees on both the state and federal level to deal with the police departments, seems really reformist in its orientation. However, there are things that you can insert in consent decrees that could chip away at the power of police departments and change the nature of the kind of segregated world in which police are operating and build the capacity for alternatives like real serious mental health response. Um, so so those, are, those are some examples. Um, and then uh, finally, I just wanted to say a word, and this is harkening back to a theme we got to in the previous session, but I just wanted to draw it out a little bit more. This is a key part of the story. Process is actually the absolute most important, it's the key variable in how we think about whether a policy or practice is abolitionist or not. So you, we can engage in an ostensibly abolitionist project that does not do that democratic work that um, Heather was talking about. Um, and that's a problem because the very concept of abolition is about liberation and democracy and power for people who have not had it. And so if people in a room like this sit on high and say this is what the policy should be, then we're doing it wrong, actually. We're engaging in a, a, a process that is maybe not carceral, but <laughs> certainly pulling away from the kind of broader goals of democracy that, that we're even talking about in the first place. So, so those are some of the provocations I wanted to uh, offer, but thank you so much for letting me be here. Where are you going? So good morning, everyone. As Brian mentioned, my name is Faith, and it is such an honor to be here at this conference, let alone presenting my research. Um, but I'm extremely excited about this opportunity, and I'm really looking forward to learning from everyone, well, continuing to learn from everyone. So today, I'll be presenting on commercial bail in the context of abolition. And I think that my work is particularly well suited to spotlight families and uneven burdens within this larger conversation. So each year, upwards of 2 million people are released from jail before their court dates through commercial bail bond agencies, which are just these third party businesses that bond selected defendants out of jail in exchange for a fee and a co-signed loan agreement. Now, on the one hand, commercial bail is lauded in some circles as an effective pretrial release mechanism, as some studies document a relatively high court attendance rate among defendant clients. On the other hand, the practice is condemned for operating as a monetary sanction that disproportionately extracts resources from low-income communities of color. But yet, few empirical studies have examined the process behind commercial bail's so-called effectiveness, right, or success. And few have also examined how the people intimately involved navigate and experience a bond and its aftermath. <coughs> So drawing on 12 months of ethnographic observation across three bail bond agencies in Harris County, and then interviews with 94 bail agents, defendants, and co-signing family members, I find that commercial bail's success, it cannot be understood without acknowledging the shadow system that they have devised, wherein co-signing family members are actually doing that unpaid labor of supervising their defendant kin and getting them to appear in court. Now, through imposing the cosign loan arrangement, through doling out what I call carceral and financial threats, and through massive emotional manipulation, um, bail agents can effectively responsibilize families, right, everyday ordinary citizens, to manage risk. So what this means is that commercial bail not only extracts financial resources from communities that are disproportionately low income and black and brown, but they're also extracting their labor, their time, their emotional resources, among likely many other factors. And the banger for me, well, all of this is a banger, but to, to drive it home is given that criminal legal contact is disproportionately concentrated among black and Latino men, 
and women are more likely to provide support in the form of co-signing or otherwise. This is really women of color, low-income women of color, that are most likely to be responsibilized for making commercial bail profitable, for making the pretrial system work, and for managing the problems that arise at home um, in the meantime. So in this way, my research requires us to focus on the full extent of harm and in turn, the magnitude of abolition's impact. So if we now transition to the question of if not commercial bail, then what? We'll find the answers or alternative pretrial systems and realities already exist. In fact, various alternatives have long existed, making commercial bail obsolete or severely limited in at least 12 states. Um, so I'm going to run through three really quickly and then end with what my research tells us about these um, existing alternatives. So one such alternative is the pretrial service agencies or PSAs, and these are publicly run programs that essentially do the same work as commercial bail bond agencies, but as a condition of non-financial release. So as a result, there is this no 10% service fee to pay up front, there's no co-signed loan to tether families financially, and there's this reduced prospect on the back end of asset seizure or debt collection should a defendant skip court. Now, PSAs were initially designed as information gathering centers that aided judges in making informed pretrial decisions. But over time, their function has evolved in some jurisdictions to service provision, right, where they do things like monitor, send court reminders, um, subsidize transportation, and efforts to increase the likelihood the defendants released on pretrial um, show up in court. Now, the positives of PSAs is that they do reduce the number of people behind bars pretrial, and they prioritize public safety, but without this intense exacerbation of wealth and race-based discrimination, right? So in some ways, they maintain the pros of commercial bail while eliminating one of its significant harms. Um, a drawback, however, is that their supervisory role can actually create challenges for defendants that may be more restrictive and costly than release via commercial bail. Now, a second existing alternative, I'm not really sure if I'm terming that right, but is bonds financed through courts. And what I mean by that is people pay courts, right, instead of bail agencies, a percentage of that bail amount for a defendant's released. And after all court hearings are attended and that case concludes, most of the deposited money gets returned back to the defendant and their family. Um, and of course, if that court date is missed, the 10% is lost and further payment may be sought out. Now, although this alternative still requires payment that could potentially become non-refundable, it retains the relative affordability of commercial bail. It allows money to be returned eventually to families instead of divested to these third-party companies. And it does not use a co-signed loan to link the financial fates of families to this profit objective of bail agents in this larger bail industry, um, effectively eliminating many but not all of the harms that I detail in my uh, dissertation work. Now, as a final alternative, bail funds are community and volunteer-driven organizations that raise money to post bail on behalf of poor defendants. Now, the funds are ideally revolving and that the people they bond out successfully complete their cases so that that money posted on their behalf gets returned so that it can be used for the next person selected. Um, bail funds have radical roots with the earliest taking form or coming into public consciousness during times when segments of society um, face threats to their civil liberties. And we'll find that the same is true today with bail funds like the Bail Project, right, or the National Bailout Collective, grounding their efforts in goals of race and class equality, liberation, and abolition. Now, while bail funds are these humanistic alternatives that sidestep many of commercial bail's pitfalls, they do have some practical shortcomings. Now, given their revolving model and limited capital, their services are often limited to defendants with misdemeanor charges and relatively low bail amounts, right? So there's a limit on who they can help. Um, and further, their need for high success rates, either to maintain legitimacy or to keep having access to these revolving funds, it may result in high levels of monitoring or imposed requirements that make them susceptible to the same pitfalls as PSAs and commercial bail. So now returning back to my research. Um, a strength, I think, of my research on commercial bail is that it expands our rubric for evaluating both the benefits and the harms of proposed alternatives. So by this I mean my research makes clear that the harm of commercial bail extends beyond financial extraction, right? It extends beyond um, economic exclusion to encompass things like relational harm, right, to families, 
mental and emotional distress, racialized and gendered inclusion, right? When we talk about women of color predominantly burdening this, this task, um, but also concentrated burden and responsibility. Um, additionally, my research emphasizes that harm is extending beyond the person charged with the crime, right? To those who co-sign the bond, but also those who don't, but are just existing within that larger support system. So consequently, Commercial Bell implores us to center families in our conversations about bail reform and then abolition, and ask not if families are included or impacted, but how, right? So the starting question then becomes, how do PSAs, how do court finance funds, how do bail funds impact families? If payment, right, the consequence we're primed to expect in this setting is still required in many of the alternatives, then it's likely that families are also bearing many less apparent costs under these alternative models. So it follows that regardless of the type of alternative institution or structure or program, the task of pretrial risk management may again fall back on support system members, especially women of color, burdening them even further in the universe of bail reform. So I think what I'd like to leave you with is when we think about bail reform and ultimately abolition, studying extreme cases or cases on the opposite end of the spectrum like commercial bail, it keeps us aware of the multifaceted harm to be addressed and the full range of people in need of liberation from oppressive systems. And that's what I have for you all. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you. I'm really excited to be talking with all of you about this today. Um, I'm going to be discussing uh, abolitionist responses to what are called gender responsive strategies or policies, which I argue enable reproductive violence against criminalized women, and particularly so for black women. So for this presentation, I'm going to show how the state of California weaponized the language, discourse, and policies of women's empowerment and care in, to illegally sterilize more than 1,000 people incarcerated in its women's prisons between 1997 and 2013, most of whom were Latina and black, and many of whom did not know and actually still may not be informed that they were sterilized. So this is very well documented in the uh, film uh, Belly of the Beast, um, and so that's where I'm pulling some of this information from today. One of the key methods for these illegal sterilizations was through the use of what are called bilateral tubal ligations, which is a permanent surgical form of sterilization. Um, there were a series of explosive news stories, state audits, and investigative reports beginning in 2013 that found that California prisons failed to provide proper informed consent when performing these procedures on pregnant incarcerated women, and in many cases, didn't even tell people that they had been sterilized because they'd been told that they were being surgically treated for other conditions. This was corroborated by women I met while doing 18 months of ethnographic field work focused on black women's experiences at a reentry home in Los Angeles. I was once part of a conversation in which a group of women shared how they avoided seeking medical assistance for vaginal issues while they were incarcerated, unless absolutely necessary, because as one woman remarked, you never know what they're gonna do or what they're gonna take. I learned that that woman was referencing what a 2013 news story later reported, that between 2006 and 2010, 148 pregnant women in California prisons were the target of coercive tubal ligations, and that there were maybe an additional 100 women sterilized dating back to the 1990s. The report notes that prison medical staff focused on coercively sterilizing women who they believed might be reincarcerated in the future. One of the women's prison's ob gynes Dr. James Heinrich, who worked at Valley State Prison, denied coercing anyone into being surgically sterilized. But records show that proper approvals from state officials for the sterilizations ne was never obtained. And even though he denied coercing pregnant people into being sterilized, Heinrich said on the record to a reporter, that he viewed these sterilizations as a cost-paying service to taxpayers because, quote, compared to what you save in welfare paying for these unwanted children 
as they procreated more. Heinrich evokes long-standing eugenicist discourses and practices about criminalized black women as hypersexual welfare dependents in order to justify sterilizing incarcerated women. And it's important to know that sterilizations like the ones Heinrich had been performing were actually in violation of federal and state financial and anti-coercion regulations. But Valley State officials, or officials at Valley State, initially claimed to not know about those regulations. But documents actually show that in 2005, someone had filed a complaint about the sterilization of a woman who had had at least six children, which then prompted prison medical officials to look deeper into the regulations around prison sterilization. But they didn't do this to ensure compliance. They admitted to actually trying to find a way around existing regulations to facilitate more sterilizations at the prison. Don Martin, a psychologist and the top Valley State medical manager from 2005 to 2008, told a reporter that she believed pregnant women who were unhoused or struggled with addiction purposefully tried to get incarcerated so they could get medical care. She said on the record to a reporter that, do I criticize these women for manipulating the system because they're pregnant? Absolutely not. But do, I don't think it should happen. And I'd like to find ways to decrease that. Martin and Heinrich had both stated on the record how they conspired to document tubal ligations for women with multiple children as an issue of medical emergency, citing additional pregnancies as a potentially fatal health danger. Martin believed that this potentially allowed them to circumvent legal requirements to gain approvals from state officials in Sacramento for sterilizations. A 2014 state audit that investigated bilateral tubal ligations in California's women's prisons between 2005 and 2013 then documented that all the records they reviewed during those eight years revealed that proper consent uh, documentation wasn't done, which means that all of the people who received tubal ligations during that time period had their legal reproductive rights violated. The audit also found that it wasn't just women who had been incarcerated multiple times who were the target of tubal, tubal ligations, and that most women who were sterilized had actually been incarcerated for the first time. So these data points are part of a larger story of how California prisons developed a sprawling approach to explicitly and intentionally violate the legal reproductive rights of people incarcerated in its women's prisons. So what's really important to note here is that Heinrich and Martin actually claimed that they were working to empower incarcerated women by making sterilizations more readily available to them. Heinrich claimed to be acting in the best interests of women who had had multiple C-sections, saying that additional births could result in potentially fatal blood loss. But this doesn't align with conventional practice recommendations for non-incarcerated people, and reversible birth control options are still considered more appropriate. Martin also claimed to be acting for women's empowerment indicating that removing sterilization barriers for incarcerated pregnant women was an important part of providing them with the same health care options as non-incarcerated women. So both Heinrich and Martin illustrate this particular pattern of reproductive violence that I unpack in my book, in which they knowingly violated the legal reproductive rights of incarcerated women, but frame their efforts as empowerment by drawing on the discourse of what's called gender responsive carceral policies in order to claim that their actions were both therapeutic and protective for criminalized pregnant women. So for the rest of my time today, I'm gonna to talk about how gender responsive carceral policies and strategies actually function to harm criminalized women because I argue that they make illegal sterilizations like the ones I've talked about today possible. So what are gender responsive strategies? In the early 2000s, gender responsive strategies or policies were proposed by a group of sociologists and criminologists as a set of evidence-based, quote, guiding principles and strategies for improving services to women offenders under criminal justice supervision. The foundational claims of gender responsive strategies are that, quote, women offenders come into criminality differently than men, 
and have unique needs in terms of correctional services. As such, gender-based differences in services should be implemented to manage women offenders more effectively and improve programs and service delivery. Many people see gender responsive strategies as an important feminist intervention in the male-centric design of the criminal punishment system. Advocates applaud it for recognizing that carceral institutions were designed for men, but now we need carceral institutions that don't just house women, but are actually designed for them. We now see most women's prisons, jails, and reentry institutions in the US and Canada invoke the language and policies of gender responsiveness. And this approach has also rapidly gained global interest. Gender responsive strategies are often celebrated by feminist criminologists and policymakers for adopting a trauma-informed, holistic approach that also recognizes the importance of cultural differences. Advocates also claim that the implementation of gender responsive strategies can meaningfully situate carceral institutions to provide women with rehabilitation and essential services and recognize the importance of criminalized mothers who are often the primary or sole caretakers of their children before incarceration. Essentially, gender responsive strategies are framed as a way to see women in an institutional context in which their gendered needs have been historically unmet. But abolition feminists, who have been critiquing gender responsive strategies for decades as problematic, would argue that these policies see women by flattening and essentializing gender and women's needs while also contributing to the expansion of carceral power. We can see this unfold when carceral actors like Martin and Heinrich claim to be in, uh, empowering incarcerated women by sterilizing them against their will and knowledge. They're able to cast their blatant violation of the law and women's reproductive self-determination as therapeutic and protective because of the discourses that gender responsive strategies make available to them. So, even though I don't think that gender responsive strategies or policies have made incarcerated women safer, invoking their importance as a commitment to incarcerated women actually obscures this reality as one of reproductive violence. And it distracts us from understanding how historically and contemporarily prisons remain unsafe places for incarcerated women and fail to meaningfully meet their needs. So when we think about how gender responsive strategies are, can be used by carceral actors like Heinrich and Martin to advance reproductive violence, I want to draw our attention to some of the language at the core of gender responsive strategies that should tell us above and beyond what they really are. A strategy to manage incarcerated women. The historical record and present well-documented conditions of sterilization in prisons show us how carceral institutions interpret, quote, managing women offenders through the frames of eugenics, anti-blackness, and punishing black women. The sterilization abuses that I've unpacked today, coupled with a long history of using prisons as anti-black eugenicist tools, exposes how carceral institutions' response to gender is to use it as a vector of racial sexual control and punishment and not gendered empowerment. So what I urge us to take from this in terms of a policy understanding is how practices that are labeled gender responsive strategies just obs uh, obscure, hide, and deflect the ways that carceral institutions punish women, and especially so for black women. So where do we go from here? First and foremost, I want us to reject gender responsive strategies and understand them as a false promise of gendered care. We can look to efforts like Black Mama's Bailout, which has been part of the work of National Bailout, with a specific focus on the release of black mothers as a form of community care and safety. This addresses problems of reproductive violence in prisons and jails by trying to get black mothers out of jail by raising bail funds that these mothers and those in their direct networks may struggle to access without becoming vulnerable to bondsmen and bounty hunters and the things that uh, the future Professor Deckard highlighted in her work. This fact sheet in the, from the 2019 bailout in Michigan, as organized by, the Michigan, Liberation, by Michigan Liberation and the Advancement Project, highlights the material and social gains that come from securing the release of black mothers in prison. 
They also highlight how bailout movements are only starting points towards abolitionist efforts, and that the elimination of cash bail altogether is part of the larger vision, which I know other folks here at the symposium are also going to talk more about. We can also take inspiration from recent abolitionist coalition efforts to reject and protest the building of new jails, like the so-called feminist jail in New York City, and instead invest in those things we know actually function as feminist forms of care. Funding for quality housing, child care, education, and health care that are not tied to carceral institutions and surveillance. We're regularly confronted with the urgency of these kinds of refusals. In Illinois, where I live, Governor Pritzker just announced two weeks ago that the state is going to spend $900 million to knock down a maximum security men's prison and a women's prison and build new replacement facilities. And advocates of this move claim that this recognizes the humanity and dignity of the people incarcerated in those facilities. But when students incarcerated at Stateville were asked about the use of those funds to build new facilities, one student, Chester McKinney, offered that he would spend $900 million on mental health resources and health care resources for marginalized communities. And we should recognize this as part of a broader recognition that the project of building kinder, gentler cages, whether gender responsive or not, proves time and time again to be a human rights disaster. So I'll close by saying, ultimately, investments in gender responsive strategies make it seem like carceral institutions are capable of rehabilitating themselves as institutions that can help criminalize women, despite demonstrating that this just becomes a shield for abuse, however well-intentioned it may seem at the outset. And would we ever give criminalized people this many opportunities to demonstrate that they could do better? Carceral institutions continue to steal from, rape, and murder incarcerated people, but we keep placing our trust in them and giving them more and more resources to try again. But this stands in direct contradiction to the ways that we treat criminalized people, whose individually caused harms can't compare to the structural damages that prisons, jails, and policing have caused. We've been willing to allow carceral institutions to experiment while lives hang in the balance, while also being told non-carceral approaches to violence and social problems are too risky and experimental to undertake. But if accountability and care is really what we're after, then we have more than enough evidence and resources to shift the resource and energy we pour into carceral institutions into anti-carceral approaches because health, wellness, and safety are fundamentally incompatible with incarceration. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon, or good before noon, I guess it is. Um, <laughs> my name is Demarcus Jenkins. I am an assistant professor of social policy and practice at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, my official title is uh, uh, assistant professor of critical race and social policy because I teach courses on critical theories of race, including critical race theory, black critical theory, Afro-pessimism, Afrofuturism, and other black intellectual thought that I think is important, um, especially in the conversation that we're having today. Um, my research um, is situated at the intersections of uh, education policy, housing policy, and criminal justice policy. So I enter this conversation really thinking about uh, the forms of incarceration that orbit uh, the schooling environments. Um, so the title of this talk, Police Free Schools Movement, Policy Change, Discourses, and Black Suffering, um, I don't think we'll talk much about the black suffering piece today, but um, part of what I highlight there is sort of how the processes of abolition, at least in the school context, um, with the removal of school resource officers, um, I have argued has contributed to black suffering and the discourses and the language that are being used and the ways that that has, has um, been approached. So love to engage in a conversation about that over um, lunch or dinner or drinks. Um, <laughs> before we get started, though, I want to settle the most important <laughs> debate of our time. 
iPhone or Android? iPhone. iPhone or Android? Raise your hand if you're an iPhone user. Most of us, most of us. Android users? Fuber mighty, fuber mighty. Um, so this is a, a conversation that really draws my attention for a lot of different reasons. I am an iPhone user and I love my iPhone um, for a number of different reasons, but the chief reason why I love my iPhone is its ability to synchronize. I have the iPhone, the iPad, the Mac, I mean the iPhone, the iPad, the MacBook. I have all these um, Apple devices, including the Apple Watch, which I absolutely love. Um, th for me, these, dice, these devices collect and leverage large amount of personal data related to what I'm entertained by, my fitness goals, uh, my health goals, and all of this is sort of under the guise of making my life smart or making my life better. These, de uh, these particular devices are enticing to consumers because they are purported to make our lives easier, more convenient, and frankly, they look nice. But I think if we strip away some of the gloss of the Apple Watch and some of these other devices, we can be reminded that they serve the very same functions as uh, devices that are imposed on folks um, who are formerly incarcerated or immigrants in different ways, right? Um, the, the iPhone and the Apple Watch allow us um, an intense devotion to tracking and quantifying all aspects of our waking and non-waking lives. Um, and I think those devices that fall under the, the um, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong side, sorry. So I think one, part of what I'm, I'm really starting to think about is the relationship between the smartwatch and sort of how this device tracks our movements and provides us this essential data under the guise of making our life easier, but again, serves similar functions to um, the ankle monitors that formerly incarcerated people are forced to wear for the purposes of predicting and controlling their behavior. There are several frameworks that I think that we can use to understand and consider the implications of our smart devices. Here, I try to think about the, the concept of luxury surveillance as a way to articulate the type of surveillance that people pay for and whose tracking, monitor, and quantification features are understood by us as benefits that we are likely to celebrate and in most cases, debate about Apple, uh, Apple phone or Android. And we also debate about which phones have the best features, which in a lot of ways is the conversation about uh, features that, are, that continue to increase the surveillance that we opt into. In general terms, consumers of luxury surveillance see themselves as powerful and perhaps even immune from unwelcome monitoring and control. We understand quantification and tracking not as disciplinary or coercive necessarily, but as a kind of care or empowerment. We understand these as something smart. Um, we, I think people who believe that they have nothing to hide willingly submit to surveillance, which we don't necessarily see them as surveillance. We pay more money to opt into this type of surveillance. And, and in some ways, this puts us into a, a specialized category, a highly privileged category of a person. Um, I think I also can uh, contrast luxury su surveillance with um, imposed surveillance. And there are different ways that we can think about supposed uh, imposed surveillance. The ankle monitor comes to mind, but there are certainly other forms, especially as we think about what's happening in our school. So here we can see the metal detectors that many, school de uh, that many schools are using as a way to um, check students' belongings for, for, for weapons. Um, during the height of the pandemic when uh, students were working from home, there were lots of other sort of software that was emerging to monitor students' activities on the computer. So when they should be working on their computers at home, there were these programs that teachers can see what you're doing and send you a note to say, hey, you're distracted. Hey, get back on task. Um, and then, of course, the uh, class cameras, CCTV cameras, and school resource officers. I understand these as forms of imposed surveillance. And for me, whether it's luxury surveillance or imposed surveillance, it all sort of falls under this umbrella or this idea that I'm thinking about is this carceral commitment. And I think as a people, we have become really, in some ways, knowingly or unknowingly, committed to these ideas of, car of, of being surveilled whether we opt into them and we spend lots of money to, to position ourselves in these sort of highly privileged categories and empowered categories, or whether they're imposed on our bodies un, un, unwillingly, there is sort of this, I don't want to call it a desire, but there is this acquiescence to being surveilled. 
in schools, I can sort of see that crossover commitment playing out in at least four different ways. Um, what sociologists call a shed argues as a school discipline superstructure is one of the ways that we see the carceral commitment sort of manifesting in schools. Um, uh, Dakota Irby has th really had us think about nets of social control, so the way discipline practices are both widening and deepening as an effort to catch more youth in trouble. So the, in order to both widen and deepen these nets of control, surveillance has to tick up. Um, there's also sort of research on hyper surveillance, but I want to sort of pivot a little bit to think specifically around school resource officers or school police, which function and under sort of this umbrella of carceral commitment. But I think in terms of our conversation around abolition and really sort of the policy stance that's been happening in education, school resource officer presents at this point one of the best opportunities to, uh, for us to really think about abolition in schools. Um, but before turning to that conversation, I just want to highlight a few sort of costs of the carceral commitment as they affect youth in schools. So we know that when youth feel surveilled or feel unsafe, right, they have um, direct impacts on their ability to pay attention in classrooms, their ability, I'm sorry, the ability to pay attention in classrooms or concentrate on their academic performance, and even how they are engaged in school functions, right? Students who don't feel safe or feel as though they are restricted are less likely to um, engage in after school activities, engage in additional school, school processes that require them to be at school for longer periods of time. There are also spatial impacts of the carceral commitment. We can think about segregation. I know that I'm doing some work right now on public housing and the federal government's Choice Neighborhood Initiative that's looking at sort of this development of mixed income housing. And a lot of that has meant increased surveillance in these mixed in income communities. Some researchers in New York have, have begun to look at what's called the public housing to prison pipeline, because we know the relationship between those people who are living in public housing and the surveillance that surrounds those, those developments and how that leads to greater, more increased opportunities for folks to get in trouble. Um, which we can also talk about how that then encourages mobility of people to move outside of, desi of desired areas for more affluent and resource rich communities. There's also inclusion, iso isolation, and just overall withdrawal. So I bring up these impacts or these costs because I think as we start thinking about how policy can be used to redress or address some of these, these impacts, here's some targeted, very specific ways that I think we can begin to have that conversation. Um, again, so I think because I work in education primarily, I think about sort of abolition or um, abolition and policy in the context of uh, school police officers. So I've been doing a lot of research around the police free schools movement, which um, depending on sort of how we think about the origins of this movement, we can look in, at Oakland, which has been one of the districts that have long standing been calling for the removal of law enforcement officers from schools. But during the summer of 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, um, a lot of the conversation around removing police from school sort of ticked up. Um, conversation really around sort of how to cut ties with the institution of police um, around schools. Um, I got the five minute mark, so I'm gonna move a little quickly through these last bits because I want us to cover some of the ways that I've been thinking about sort of what that means, right? So um, during the summer of 2020, a lot of school districts decided or started making decisions or considering removing police from schools or cutting ties with police officers. So in my work, I've looked at um, school board meetings for over 50 districts across the country. Distri and I looked specifically at the school board meetings where that decision to remove police officers was um, being considered. Each one of the school board meetings had what's called the public comment session where stakeholders can come and voice their opinions to support or oppose policies, being, uh, policies under consideration. So I examined all of those public comments across those districts to really try to get a sense of how support those who supported the removal of police and those who opposed the removal of, of police from schools, how they frame their argument and what those arguments might tell us about the possibilities of abolition within um, schools. Uh, within schools. A couple key, key terms or key themes that came out from that, from that research. One is this, this effort to obscure law enforcement as an arm of anti-black violence. And what happens in that is there is the reality that police or school police officers are part of this broader institution of policing, but not necessarily connected to anti-blackness or anti-black violence. 
which there was an obliqueness there that if we're willing to understand that the broader context of police is rooted in anti-blackness, how then do we not see school police as part of that? And a lot of that came from individual relationships with officers. I had an officer that was good to me. I had an officer that served the community well. I had an officer who high-fived the kids and brought um, you know, uh, toys around Christmas. So it was this really this bad apple narrative that was sort of surrounding instead of the broader, uh, instead of the broader context of the institution of police, which I think if we obscure the anti-blackness from the actual violence that police uh, can potentially have in youth in schools, I think that works to disappear how black folks suffer in schools. Another major idea that came up was sort of this political difference that I'm, I'm still navigating between liberal and radical approaches to abolition. Um, this really makes me think about a comment that my colleague made earlier around these sort of interim wins that we need to celebrate along the way um, and that, co that comes up a lot with sort of the discourses, how we sort of think about a step forward as a win in the direction of abolition. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm not convinced yet. In some ways, I think about how, those, how, how celebrating those, those minor wins, although necessary, might allow us to get stuck. And if those become stop gates, do we ever get to, the, to, to realizing abolitionist dreams? Or do we begin to settle with things, settle is such a strong word, or do we begin to um, just accept things like restorative justice, which again is an important practice, but again, does that get us to the end goal of abolition? So I'm still wrestling with it and trying to figure out how to, to think about that. Um, in addition to examining the public comments that were made during those uh, school board meetings, I also looked at um, um, school district resolutions that were passed around removing school police, uh, removing school uh, law enforcement from school. Excuse me. Um, and one of the things so I looked at the um, school board resolutions from across 50 school districts as well, both urban, rural, suburban, in all different contexts. And one of the main outcomes or alternatives that were proposed in those um, resolutions were restorative justice. It was really this idea that we need to hire more restorative justice personnel or school counselors. So those were sort of the two main um, alternatives to police, which, you know, which took me to this sort of third paper. This third idea is really sort of thinking about how educators and school leaders are deputized to function as carceral arms. So if we are just hiring more people under different names to then exercise the same activities of the carceral arm, are we moving toward abolition or are we shifting it? And one of my colleagues on the panel thought about that today as well as to think about how we're just shifting the modes of carcerality across different personnel. Um, I got the time um, indicator, so I just want to go to this last slide. I won't be able to go over all these things really quickly, but just to point out a few sort of things I'm, I'm thinking with around policy and practice. One, I think about sort of, again, going back to the, the liberal forms of abolition that are well intended, um, but do they get at systems and structures and will they get us closer to radical abolition? I'm still wrestling with that question. I don't yet have answers, but I think it's worthy uh, for us to, to pontificate around. Um, there's also a question around a more comprehensive approach to, dis, to disarm, disempower, and disband law enforcement from schools. School board resolutions, what we've seen, especially in large urban districts, is this rolling back of those, of those resolutions. Um, so, you know, in 2020 saying we're going to cut ties with law enforcement, then 2021 saying we're going to hire a whole lot more. How do we think about the, the teeth that those resolutions may have, and if they don't, what might a more comprehensive approach be at the district and state level around abolition? Um, practice, I really think about the way that we train educators, the way that we train school leaders is still rooted in abolitionist ideas and logics. I'm sorry, it's still rooted in carceral ideas and carceral logics. This idea that we have to remove unruly students, this idea that surveillance is the mechanism to ensure safety and higher academic outcomes. There's overwhelming um, evidence that says that that is not always the case. How do we think about how we are training those who lead our schools? And now that I've been told to wrap it up, on number four, I just want to also point out that that I started the conversation thinking about surveillance. Um, the, what, what concerns me now around sort of surveillance is the seductive nature of ed tech surveillance, uh, ed tech companies that are marketing surveillance 
um, mechanisms to schools as a way to say, you have this money that you are diverting away from law enforcement, now give it to us and we can have these sort of invisible forms of surveillance and security. Which again, if we're thinking about abolition, does moving resources from one mode of, uh, of surveillance across rally to sort of these technologies of surveillance, does that get us to um, realizing our abolitionist dreams? Thank you. No. All right, before I begin, I would like to um, uh, state my charge, which was to, ex uh, we expect discussants to listen to the presentations with a careful ear towards policy and practice <laughs> in hopes of steering the Q&A session to practical solutions. And that's all that I was expected to do until Heather got up. <laughs> And, you know, totally changed the tenor of, like, <laughs> that charge. And that led me scrambling to come up with, in, like, an hour, not necessarily PowerPoint, but, like, some sort of coherence in order to, you know, make sense of abolition as policy. And I must confess that, like, I wondered, why did John ask me to be the discussion on abolition. What do I know about abolition? Um, and so in thinking about this, I went back to Garland 2001 and thinking about mass incarceration and the two features of mass incarceration, which first is the sheer size which we can think of as the volume or the churning so that the imprisonment rate is somehow disproportionately and historically um, out of alignment with what was once the norm, not just for our society, but across societies that look like our own. And then the second feature being concentration effects, such that imprisonment of whole groups of the population um, becomes possible. And he reminds us that, you know, Durkheim would consider this to be a pathological phenomenon. And it's one in which Louis Quant challenges this characterization or, or specification of mass and in, instead favors hyper-incarceration as a more precise designation of what he deems triple selectivity, which I think for this entire symposium really gets at the issue of race, class, and space. And I'd add in gender to that as well as a constitutive property of the phenomenon. And so in thinking about this, I, you know, confessing like I didn't know much about abolition, I turned to one of my, the writings of my colleague and collaborator, Angeli Verma, in this Oxford handbook chapter titled Mass Incarceration, Decarceration, and Abolition Beyond Keywords. And I just want to read part of the passage of that paper. And it says, quote, evoking the legacy of US chattel slavery and transnational movements to end all systems of slavery, abolition was often dismissed within criminology as a radical fringe term, signifying anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and anti-war politics considered threatening to dominant social orders and namely to the foundation of law and order governance under mass incarceration. Abolition has reanimated in the 21st century lexicon as increasingly potent vocabulary for reimagining public safety, systems of security, and justice, and the role of the state. Whether this new abolitionism features more centrally into criminological canons as a transformative concept, however, remains as open as the question of mass incarceration's abolition, end quote. And for me, that's where I think this panel uh, steps in, to, to take on the various, uh, what I call, uh, considerations about abolition, abolitionism. And the first consideration involves the sort of theoretical and empirical tenets of abolition. So what is abolition? 
what are its measurements, operationalizations, and limitations, as well as its limits. Additionally, is abolitionism simply decarcerating jails and prisons? Or does abolitionism mean more than that? So what does abolition mean in the context of home confinement versus jails and prisons? What does it mean in the context of other surveillance and financial punishments? So we've seen the work of various scholars on this panel take up the issues of bail as a financial punishment and as a burden on families and communities, and in particular, you know, uh, black women and women of color. We've seen from Professor Jenkins' very uh, uh, masterful claiming of additional time that it also, <laughs> that it also, it also means, it also means that like surveillance is, is self policing. And it reminds me deeply of, you know, Foucauldian biopower in its most efficient form is when we are regulating ourselves and surveilling ourselves and others. And so abolition, abolitionism needs to incorporate communities that benefit from and rely on prisons and jails and other systems of surveillance and inequality. Um, or what you know the the previous panel referred to as carceral capacity, and thinking about uh, upcycling. The third feature I think of abolitionism has to focus on the socio legal and statutory context, which Professor Bell outlined uh, very uh, nicely in terms of thinking about uh, consent decrees. Um, the use of uh, various lawsuits and others. And I want to also add that in the context of immigration, again, from the earlier panel, immigration blurs these civil and criminal laws in ways that, as I believe uh, Professor Decker pointed out, functions in this sort of shadow carceral state that uh, Catherine Beckett and Naomi Marikawa have have written about, but in their writings, they also point to something else, and that is legal hybridity. That is, the different types and forms of law in and of themselves are beginning to be blurred and fused and hybridized in such a way that now um, in entering into or exposure to one particular system may increase your likelihood of exposure to another system that were completely independent systems. And in my work with Angelie Vermer, my colleague that I mentioned, we write about legal hybridity in California, and specifically across all 29 California legislative code sections. And we find that these different types of punishments, both financial and also physical, are embedded in both criminal and civil law. And they are fusing in ways that now we're all laying witness to, particularly in the context of reproductive health and women's reproductive health. And I think that uh, Professor Gursami's work illustrates this uh, very uh, point uh, importantly, because states are currently criminalizing rehabilitative, or I'm sorry, reproductive health in ways that women seeking abortions or women seeking other, uh, uh, or trying to make other health decisions, or uh, people who, uh, members of the transgender community, and even book burning, right? These are now becoming civil offenses for which not only is the patient the object, but so too are the doctors and the hospitals. And in doing so, it, it, it's blurred from once being or now becoming a, a criminal matter to also being a civil matter. And so these legal hybrids are something that abolitionism needs to contend with in its foundations from the moment of policy construction all the way to policy repeal. And so I want to challenge or offer up to the panelists the opportunity to think about the different forms of abolitionism 
how you can you know, reform or dismantle unequal systems. Um, in California, they currently have the California Racial Justice Act of 2020 as one means to give uh, inmates and prisoners the opportunity to exercise their agency in ways that will, um, that will bring back their dignity, their democracy, and possibly their liberty. And so I want to challenge you to think about the work in which you're doing and the forms of abolitionism and their limits, their tenets, their uh, specifications, and how we can begin to take existing laws and get them either off the books or reform them, and then also how we can think about uh, what's happening now in the contemporary landscape where various communities are being criminalized and I don't know if civilized is the word to use to denote uh, civil law, but like the reality is, is that now these legal hybrids are operating in a way that really isn't shadow. It's really not shadow. It's really out there, and we need to deal with that. Thank you. <laughs> Ruben? Or Professor Miller? Thanks. Uh, so uh, I had uh, two questions. But first, Brian, great job. <laughs> great job. Great job. Great job. And thank you also for reminding me why I love black people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, uh, and, and, and your question about like the, 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 the criminal the, 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 from, um, from criminal to a civil matter, which is which is which is also a criminal matter in the case of doctors, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, performing abortions uh, in, in, in in a bunch of states now. Um, but I have, I have uh, two questions for the panel, um, one for Faith, but maybe also for the panel too. Um, and uh, I think, uh, DeMarcus, you really, uh, or Professor Jenkins, like you, 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 you moved us in this direction um, when you, when you uh, asked the question at the end of your presentation, which is, you know, do these things that I think abolitionists might call reformist reforms or something like that, right, like, like the, the, the line that you were skirting, uh, lead us to our uh, abolitionist dreams. I think our is doing a lot of work there, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I want to I want to um, sort of highlight that. And I and I think that John is inviting us to do some of that our work mm -hmm. um, when when he's taking abolitionism as um, it's like taking it for granted that it's that it that it that it that it, that it is a um, that it that it could and should drive policy that it does drive policy. So 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 how. So it's like abolition and, and, and social policy. And so, and so what's, the, what's the power of presuming abolition is reasonable um, where others don't? Um, uh, uh, and I don't think this is a, I don't think the, the project that you're asking us to engage in is a big tent politics kind of project, you know, the type that folks engage in that say, let racism walk the hook, you know what I mean? Like, like, like it's, 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 it's something very different. It's a, it's a radical community politic. But it makes me wonder, um, what do you need to have in, in common to work with people who don't share the abolitionist dream to, to bring about a vision of abolition? And it seems to me that that's all of that, like all abolitionists do this, but I, but I wonder like, like what, is, what is that thing? Um, and then for faith, uh, and this is one question for faith, and, and, but also maybe, maybe it's a question for the panelists. You know, I'm thinking about bail reform uh, that's passed in Illinois, because I'm from Chicago, I'm like Chicago, all day Chicago, so 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 it's so so it's so it's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I'm thinking about a young brother who 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 is um, now not gonna get out of jail because there's no bail set, and it allows for um, judicial discretion that didn't used to be there. And and this seems to be the 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 um, the move uh, for any sort of progressive moment. And, and I don't know if it's backlash or if it's just the ways that punishment operates, uh, how it takes up space in the new reality or something like that. But, but every, every move to, to, to make a thing better leads to like something else. And, 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 and does that mean it's not worth engaging in is, is a question. You know, like, like so, so and, and that's, that's, that's one of my questions around the work of abolition and the, and the quote non-reformist reform, like, like the challenge to that is, well, everything worth doing you know, leads to something else. And, and the something else is often taken up. Anything once institutionalized is institutionalized. 
So anyway, I'm talking too long, but mm -hmm. those, are, those are my two questions. Maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah. I feel like I do not have a perfect answer um, because I struggle with that too. And I think like the, the first example that came to mind from my research is that with, um, in Harris County, they were also doing reform when I um, was interning in commercial bill agencies. And basically, defendants were being let out for free or no charge if um, they had a misdemeanor offense. And the bail agents would say, we hate this, right? Because they let them out for free, something happens, they get rearrested, and now the bond gets set way higher than it would have originally done, right? So you're almost being penalized for not taking advantage of your free get out of jail card. Right, so now it's even harder for you to meet that bar uh, or meet a commercial bail agency. And so for them, they're like, it doesn't really change anything. It's just, it's delayed re-entrenchment, right? It's, you still end up in the system. Um, and so, I don't wanna say, I don't wanna think that that means give up <laughs> on reform, right, to stop. But I hear you, that's a part of the conversation that has to be had that Backlash occurs, right, when we do make these incremental steps. So I, I don't know. I, I think if I can just yeah. maybe chime to um, think through some things as well. Um, I, your, your question made me think about sort of where Du Bois and Angela Davis depart mm -hmm. in, their, in, their, in their ideology. Um, and one of their core points of departure is around the role of the state if the state is an apparatus through which abolition can be achieved, hmm. or do we sort of, I don't wanna say buck the system, but do we not en engage the state in that process of abolition? I still wrestle with that, right? So I, I'm not sure if I'm Team Du Bois or Team Davis on that, or at least earlier Davis, like her, her philosophy changed over, over time, but I, I, I think that becomes part of the question for me. I think the other piece too, is sort of when, when I think about like abolition and its core goal to reduce harm and this idea of how do we ap celebrate, appreciate, acknowledge these wins along the way, it's hard for me to tally those as wins because for me all they do is shift the capacity to reproduce harm and they don't destroy that capacity. So if we are, oh, okay, we're moving away from police, but now we're increasing surveillance. Well, we, I don't know if we've necessarily gotten to a place where we have begun to destroy the capacity to reproduce harm. And I think in order to sort of move toward abolition, the core question for me that fundamentally starts the conversation is, do we believe that we can live in a world where harm does not exist, right? So if we can think that harm can be completely eradicated, if we think that, then I think that gets us to different ways of saying, nah, that's just another form of harm. Nah, that just opens the door for another reproduction of harm, and I think that that for me, that makes it more difficult to say, well, yeah, we got to win here, but there's still this harm that's being done. So, I, you know, I, I, I don't have a complete answer to your question, but I think for me, it, part of it is like it becomes sort of this idea of can a world exist without harm in that way, and harm generally, right? Can, and if it can, what do we need to do to get there? And is getting there just sort of shifting who has the capacity to inflict harm? All right, we only have time oh, for one or two more questions. So I'm just gonna ask that you all ask your questions and then we'll give the panelists 30 seconds to respond. I'm gonna make a case quickly for comparative study. Um, one is that, um, uh, Professor Jenkins, I'm wondering if when we think about police in schools, white schools tend to think of the police as in service of students and in service of teachers. So for instance, there's a school fight. Teacher's like, I'm not breaking that up. Officer. Or they feel like they're gonna protect the school from a school shooting, et cetera. And obviously in black schools, it's about surveillance. It's about right other things. And so it allows us to see um, what Professor Friedman would call racist intent. Mm. 
and I and I just want to put that out there. The same for Faith. I was thinking, when you go to see Bond Court, and I think it's worth the comparative study here. They make the family stand up. It's always women, and the public defenders will say, if you see those, if they if you stand up, then they'll set a fair bail or bond. But they make them, and that criminalizes the women too. They stand up like they're in attendance of the court. Now they just eradicated that bond, but again, the ten percent. If it's ten percent of five thousand dollars, you can't. That's the right. Like you can't. Mm -hmm. That's you can't. Mm -hmm. And who does it? Women. So that I didn't realize the women's <coughs> labor part of that, but I'm I, I'm gonna press and say comparatively, it might distill the uniqueness of the commercial bond versus the state version. Okay. It's like saying for profit prisons are worse than state prisons. Uh uh. <laughs> it's different in kind, but right. very similar in its role. So I'm just putting that out. Yeah, and thank you, else Heather. Heather. Thank you so much for this really great panel. Um, uh, John, I think I finally understand why we're all in this room. <laughs> As he knows, I sort of pushed him on this uh, abolition, you know, poly abolition of policy and, and what we should be thinking about here. But I think this panel really brought it together uh, for me. Um, and it, it does, I think, come down to this question, uh, DeMarcus, about whether and how we engage the state, right? And there's a real tension, I think, that was brought up between Faith and um, uh, Cecilia's uh, uh, papers. And that is to say that as um, Cecilia sort of rightly, uh, you know, is outraged um, by this um, practice in California, and then looking ahead to, you know, what does abolition look like? Abolition looks like the community doing these things for people, right? Um, but then when you think back to what Faith told us, right, um, this then puts potentially sort of, we could think of it as an unfair burden on the community and the families. Um, and why is that the case? Because Monica tells us that there is legal estrangement, but that these state institutions have not historically and continue to not involve the people that they need to involve, particularly poor people of color, but also you know wider than that, right? It comes back to this question of democracy. And so are we not engaging the state because the state you know hasn't engaged with with you know us historically, right? Um, and so you know I'm interested in hearing you kind of think about that that tension there. In 30 seconds. <laughs> if, if I might. Um, so I think for me, one of the keys for this is really thinking about um, uh, Angela Davis and her co-authors, their book, Abolition Feminism Now, where they say abolition feminism is about the both and. So I think it's not about saying, you know, we only rely on the community. We only rely on folks in their own networks and resources, or we only look to negotiate with the state. I think we have to do both, and abolition is about really thinking about the hybridity of, st of strategies, of moments, of methods, and that we're all gonna serve different purposes. And that there's something productive about the tension and about the fact that we disagree about the methods and moments. Mm -hmm. um, and like I think precisely all of us in this room, the fact that we're coming at this from different angles and, problem and problematizing these different strategies, it's, it requires everything. Mm -hmm. An abolitionist imagination requires all of us mm -hmm. to engage in that work mm -hmm. because the white supremacist imagination is also pretty <laughs> extensive. Yeah. And yeah, so we yeah. need everybody to really yeah. be involved yeah. in thinking about that unmaking. Mm -hmm. And can I, I know we're pressed for time, <laughs> but um, I don't know if this is what you meant by process, but what comes to mind in my case is not always, but family members do want to help. They do want to show up. They don't want their loved one in jail. I would say what is so amazing about interviews and ethnography is unwinding that process that makes it punitive for families, right? It's the coercion that bail agents do. It's the manipulating their emotions. It's making them subjects of surveillance and carceral control, right? And so like, that's what we have to eliminate. And then perhaps maybe it becomes less toxic and less harmful for families to engage. Monica, you get last word. Okay, great. I, I was hoping I got to say something. This is such a rich, rich question. Um, but one, uh, so um, Ruben asked the question about like what is the baseline for working with people who don't share the same abolitionist vision. For me, it's 
how seriously are they, they taking the humanity of the the marginalized people with mm. which we're working with like yeah. and one of the things i've unfortunately seen is people who i think share my politics mm. um who don't mm. take mm. the humanity Preach. of people seriously yeah. but that for me is the baseline more so than the ostensible politics mm -hmm. number two very quickly you asked about celebrate how do we celebrate the wins and i just want to be very clear like the, the, the ostensible wins mm -hmm. um a i think we need to be clear that celebration mm -hmm. is not is not it. Like, I mean, so, like, I think, you know, um, one of my students said one time, like, I think on the left we need, you know, more strategists, mm -hmm. you know, like, we, we need more organizers, but we also need strategists. And I think that's, for me, what's really important, mm -hmm. is how do we see things that might not really uh, totally align with, a, with an abolitionist vision as part of a longer term strategy, and that requires us to drill more deeply. It's not like, oh, is it a reformist win? It's like, what kind of win? What is the specific policy? <laughs> like, so some policies would be off the table. That's why I think the language of liberal form of abolition doesn't totally make sense mm. because the very idea of abolition rejects some of these mm. kind of like. For, you know, as, as Brian was inviting us to think about. So, so anyway, I'm going to stop talking because we're totally out of time. But, um, but thank you. This is really productive. Do you think we can have these?